It's live on YouTube also now. And Ajivala, Ajivala, I think you seem to have. Uh, Rajesh is here. Rajesh, yes, good yes. evening. Good evening. How are you? Fantastic ah, background. Evening. Fantastic background, Rajesh. Ah, I know that hides my real background. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See, look, uh, look, Amar. I have been there forty-one years. Now this oh, is oh. my for background, foreground, all. <laughs> all grounds. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Good evening, Rajesh Malhotra. Good evening. Uh, how are you? Yeah. How are you? Nice to have you on good, board. Good, good, good. Yeah, it's nice. With, it's a pleasure. Yes, with all uh, you know, experts from across the continent now. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The background looks you know very nice. Only these are this is only a dream now. We can't um, expect anything like that in future, I guess. It's like a custom made. Uh, I think the day COVID goes, the day COVID, nice. the day COVID goes, we'll light up pimps like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, great! That's that's going to be that's going to be fun. If COVID is going to go, that's a big million dollar question, Rajesh. I think we need to live it, live around COVID, and then I think I don't know. We'll let let's let's hope, let's hope, let's listen to what you guys have to say. What about uh, Operation Wall Street uh, from uh, Trump yesterday night? Vaccines, ah. vaccines by the end of the year, December. That is too late, Srikant. We are going to come much before that. You are going to get some good news from us today. Okay, fantastic. Good evening, Saket. Good evening. So, uh, how is how is indoor? Are you indoor in indoors? <laughs> Things are not good. Uh, good evening, Rajesh Marotra sir, John sir, and uh, good evening, sir. good evening, Saket. आपको देख के खुश हो गया दिल. <laughs> How are you? Saket is indoor in indoor. I'm not exactly indoor, sir. I am outdoor as well. But the things are getting improved day by day. I believe. Okay. 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 Uh, mm. Now, indoor in Ahmedabad, I think a deadly strain of uh, coronavirus. Sir, Ahmedabad, the things are more rampant than indoor. Ah, uh -huh. it's slightly better off. There are pockets where the things are bad, but otherwise the. The place where you and Amarnath sir and uh, Rajesh Malhotra sir have visited, they are clean. The east okay. of Indore is the cleaner side. Okay. John sir, John yeah, sir. Ah, yeah, okay. Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad had slipped to number three. It was on number two. <laughs> now, now, now this catch twenty two will keep on going across the world. <laughs> Somebody I'm slipping. No, I'm India's... surprised because Indore is the cleanest city of India. And how could it get affected so much? I want to ask Saket. No, Indore was sir, very was, bad in the beginning. Sir, it was not the beginning, sir. The initial part of because of the changeover of the government one and two, oh. there was a paucity in training the uh, the passengers who were coming from the international and the domestic area because Indore is the place uh, where the maximum flights were there before the flights were stopped. Okay. And then, uh, quote unquote, which I cannot say, the pockets where uh, things couldn't be controlled, you know. Okay. During okay. that switchover of the government time. But now the situation is better, sir. Improved by seventy percent. Oh, great! That's good news for us. I believe that in 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 a week or two, it should be very much under control. Fantastic! Great. John, uh, we are at uh, 16:35 now, and uh, yes. we are 108 people already. And yeah. uh, uh, I think it's time to go. Uh, so Talkani is in the meeting, so welcome, uh, welcome Talkani. Imtiaz, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Imbi. Thanks, thanks. Oh, nice um, to see you. Hello, Amma. Amarnath, how are you? Fantastic, hello. fantastic, Imtiaz. It's been nice to see you. Uh, you, you are hiding. 108. You are 108. I've been hiding. I've Okay, sir, join uh, Rajesh, bolo. Huh? Nahin, nahin. I am Amar Desa. 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 I Yeah, John, I think uh, uh, we are just getting to start now. Uh, what's yeah. going to happen is I think we are going to get uh, uh, Kaushik is going to be just uh, yeah, sir. getting on and then we can... Uh, uh, sir, uh, another one minute if we can wait. 
Uh, so just fine. one minute. Should be fine. In time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. I great. expected that if we can cross uh, 150. <laughs> no, no, no. We will cross more than 1,000. Don't worry. It's being live streamed on YouTube. Achha, live stream is also happening. Yeah. Live stream and is and also. The cam is already on. On the last, auto was, last time, Kaushik, it was 1,200. Okay. 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 I, I've sent you the screenshot. I've sent you. I so, am so happy to see uh, Dr. Sakya Jati, sir, because yesterday I got information that uh, he is not there. So, so happy to see you, sir. I'm so happy to see uh, Dr. Smith from UK and uh, uh, Rajesh Malhotra, sir, from Delhi. You are happy to see everyone. Don't forget me and Amar now. <laughs> Pray for Ahmedabad. Pray for Ahmedabad, sir. <laughs> Rajesh, greeting. How are you? I'm great. Good evening. Good evening. It's been a long time I haven't seen you. How are things? Did you get your robot? It's cooking. It's cooking inside. Uh, <laughs> what? Kaushik, Amit is going to give the introduction part now. Shall we start? Sir, uh, OP sir is coming today. Oh, we, we, are, we are getting OP. Yeah, OP sir is coming today. Uh, OP is, uh, now, shall we wait for him or let him No, no, him? no, just uh, and, and maybe he's joining. He's joining. Yeah. He's joined, he's joined, he's sir. Joined. He has joined. Okay. Uh, uh, let me introduce. He has joined. He has joined. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me give an uh, introduction to sir oh. once, once he joins in. Ganesh, can you put sir on spotlight? Vivek, your uh, laptop is on. My laptop Ganesh, is on. Can you put OP sir on spotlight? Yeah. Uh, can we all mute, mute ourselves, please? Hi, Manoj. Welcome to you. Can you? Yeah. 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 Sir, video on me after our uh, joint cut off at one forty five, one forty five. Okay, the joint cut off coming to the other. Hello, 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 One, sir. Muted by host. Minus the owner. Yeah, that's great. Great, great. Uh, Opie, good evening. Amanath, sir. Amanath, sir. Hi, good evening. John, sir. Uh, hello, Opie, good evening. Uh, let's let's sir, this is uh, uh, the corporate of Canada. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let uh, me let me introduce, sir, uh, for the benefit of the whole group. And uh, sir, we today we have four continents: uh, India, Africa, uh, Europe, America, uh, joining here. Uh, we have Dr. Daniela Smith, Dr. John Ebenezer, Patmashri, uh, Dr. Rajesh Malhotra from uh, Ames, Delhi, Dr. Mohammed from Egypt. Uh, we have a whole uh, uh, continents, uh, except Australia, we have all the continents here today. And uh, for the benefit of the group, uh, over Mr. O.P. Singh, uh, the president of Cadilla, and has some certain message. We all are in COVID times, challenging time, difficult time, but we all are expecting something um, from the pharmaceutical industry to come forward. And that is what is the message uh, O.P. Sir is going to share to all of us. And then we'll start. Yes, sir. Namaste. It's India. Thank you so much to Dr. John, the director of GOI, but my good friend, who is Padma Sri and BC Rai awardee. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. I always take this privilege to thank join so the committee. And at the same time, I thank Dr. Amarnath, a good friend, 
and director of GOI. Thank you, Dr. Amarnath, for arranging this event where the whole continent has joined. Thank you. Thank you, Opi. Opportunity to thank on behalf of Cadilla Management to all the eminent speakers of today's event, Dr. Professor Rajesh, Rajesh Malhotra, Dr. Everett Smith, Dr. Anand Nanu, Dr. Ajib Ola B. Oladiran, Dr. Bibek Naginhal, Professor Muhammad Majiad, Dr. Anthony Jansen, and Dr. Andrew J. Hall. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation by our good friend, Dr. John and Dr. Amarnath. I am president of Kerala Pharmaceutical India, one of the largest uh, corporate, and we are here to serve this ailing humanity from this COVID pandemic. I'm happy to inform you all here that one of our drug is under trial and we are expected the result in next two months time. And the drug, which is called immunomodulator, which is here, Cefcivac. This is the dose where the trial is started in Ames, Delhi, Ames, Bhopal, PGI Chandigarh, and now we have got clearance, ethics committee clearance at four different centers in Apollo. It has got amazing success story where it has to be given 0.3 ml per day, 0.1 ml intradermal at three different sites for three consecutive days, which not only going to give result in COVID, but this is a drug already approved by BCGI for the treatment of sepsis. And the COVID and sepsis, in fact, if you find that cytochrome storm, that's what is the reason of the death and that what it prevents. So I can only say it reduces mortality, which is going to be the big news, maybe in the months or two months time. And the brand name is Sepsivac, which saves more lives, which contains heat killed Mycobacterium W, also known as Mycobacterium indicus prani, a sep saprophytic non-pathogenic strain of Mycobacterium. It is an immunomodulator and known to contain multiple antigens. So I can only say this is going to be the true savior after the trial because the first 10 patient report is very, very encouraging. But we cannot talk at the moment, but yes, it is already approved drug for the treatment of sepsis. So I think with this, I can only say these are the this is the trial, which is a drug from CSIR. Cadilla is the only partner in manufacturing. And I think whatever we are discussing here is the proprietary of the CSIR. We are only a facilitator. The whole technology is Government of India. So with this, I can say we This is going to be the big hope for the whole world. And that way we can really serve to this humanity and this ailing fraternity from such a dreaded infection. With this, I must thank for a wonderful event for which we all are here to talk about geriatric orthopedic, I mean, in the orthomedics group and the experts from across the continent is going to share the experience. Thank you so much, Dr. John. And thank you, Dr. Amanath. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks. Th thank you, OP. And also, you, OP. we have a good news from Bangalore as well. Yes. So we, we are going to be having a good, good uh, performance. And then it's a good ray of hope. And I see Amit in the background. I also wish yes. Amit. Yes. So it's a major four continent CME today. Absolutely, Amit. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We will get on. So yeah, we got OP, 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 you said something. Go we got a, got a chat box from Dr. Shrikan that there is a good news of trial from Bangalore as well. I was about to tell about the entire uh, story about Karnataka government. There was a meeting with the chief minister 
and the whole medical fraternity and this was found to be one of the most effective drug for the treatment of covid at the moment and they are trying it out yes thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you dr john thank you so much thank you okay thank you amit see you on right dr kaushik yeah sir uh, amarna sir you can uh, you can start the proceedings sir yeah. wonderful thank you thank you for, uh, uh, all the faculty uh, we have been uh, waiting awaiting for this uh, you know unprecedented uh, times unprecedented uh, uh, i think events and everything is going to be in favor of us corona is definitely going to be defeated come what may and whoever says whoever has brought it god bless them but yes we are going to be the winners and today without taking much time uh, let me get on uh, to get our chair person dr john and dr john are you going to be introducing the uh, faculty or what is the plan yeah the speakers are all stalwarts and uh, there is Fantastic. no need to introduce um, anyone because they are all um, luminaries by their own standards uh, and um, only i can express my gratitude that they have accepted the invitation and uh, they have come here and uh, you know we are going to become wiser by listening to all of them a lot of good news is happening and uh, you know hopefully um, the virus will be behind us soon so i think amar you please start the proceedings yeah. let us okay uh, so, yeah, thank you thanks so thank you uh, before i get that there are two speakers who have been uh, not in the uh, circuit uh, we have brought them for the first time uh, that is dr anand nanu who is a, a former british orthopedic association uh, president and he is one of our uh, new uh, faculties and the second one to join and he's going to give us a lot of information and then andrew hall he is actually the deputy chair for fracture audit group in scotland government of scotland and we are going to be linking him to an exclusive program in the next few days to come without my wasting much time and i'm going to get uh, dr rajesh malhotra first uh, faculty please uh, if you're going to have any presentation to make you could go ahead and uh, share the screen and we will have a q and use as we go on and lot of questions have been lined up and on the chat box as well we're going to get a lot of interactions coming in across the globe thank you rajesh if you're ready can you start to share the screen please sure amar i am uh, ready and uh... Uh, rajesh your network is very low uh, can you switch off the video if that's possible your network is very low we are not able to hear you Uh, thank you parimala thank you thank you uh you want switch off the video uh, your your screen will be on uh, basically don't worry i'll guide you hello sir hello hello yeah rajesh your screen, screen is coming on now yeah can you see me uh, uh can you hear me We, we can hear you we can hear you definitely so is it okay is it better than i can start i have i have shut down the video your voice is much better otherwise it was crackling and we couldn't hear you at all well, i i actually don't want you to see me getting nervous during the talk so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> where are you give basic facts so that everybody can discuss this so um, so let's talk about the uh, evolving global orthopedic practice uh, and uh, this is the new normal now uh, we have to live when we will see each other just like that and uh, you know i mean maybe for a long time to come and this is the new sport which is uh, really like a fencing and uh, we have the uh, 570 districts which are as of for managing you know there's a whole world of difference between how we are now going to manage our outpatient patient in the follow ups and theaters 
and let me first talk about the problems so we can't see your presentation uh, malotha sir uh, rajesh we are not able to see your presentations at all uh, we are uh, having challenges with your network as well yeah your network is very weak it says and uh, we are able to hear you with crackling sound but where are you Uh, uh, patients for emergency uh, department. Yeah. Rajesh, Rajesh, we are not able to see your screen at all. Is that right? Yeah. For the last okay. uh, since you started, your voice has been crackling, and then the screen is being uh, not sure it's shared. Uh, there's a there's a huge okay. network problem. So where do you start? Right, the beginning. You could, you could. I'm, I'm suppose. Yeah. Please. So uh, this is the new normal, uh, no. Amar. As I was saying, Rajesh, and Rajesh, uh, maybe for Rajesh, a long time to come. Yeah. Your screen. I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, we are not able to see the screen. Uh, is everybody okay? Uh, yeah. Now, we now we can see. Now we can see. Yes. yes. Okay. So let me know whenever there is a problem, right? Absolutely. And uh, just a minute. And so, so that's I said is the new normal. and for a long time to come maybe this is how the things will be and this is the perfect sport for current times because uh, you have to be in your mask you don the gloves and anybody tries to get closer to you by less than by 6 feet and all uh, you just stab them and this is india and uh, we have as of uh, now the uh, seven, uh, 576 districts which are affected 163 districts which are not affected and you can see the this is the number of patients these are the people who have recovered as of today the total number of cases are over 86000 with 200 uh, 2754 deaths so now the challenge is in the covid times how to sort of reorient your practice with respect to outpatients the new patients as well as follow ups the wards and the theaters and let me outline some of the problems which some of your countries may face but uh, for the benefit of indian viewers i can tell the main problems we have is the problems of manpower because we have people who are still working when they are above 60 we have the all kind of healthcare workers who um, who uh, have comorbidities then we have some health workers who undergo quarantine we have to delegate some of the manpower towards the covid the living capacity especially we have pre op uh, if we start the routine surgeries the pre operative patients emergency department patient all the covid suspects and then of course the social distancing will lead to space crunch where all our outpatients were already very badly over overcrowded our operating procedures are aerosol generating they are resource consuming we need a large amount of uh, ppes then the uh, you have to have at least three defined areas designated areas as covid negative covid positive and covid suspect for the best practice you need protective gears in sufficient quantity there is an anxiety or panic among the healthcare workers and then you know lot of the medical equipment and supplies which are imported from abroad have now been stalled and you know it is a challenge to get your expensive equipment repaired and the part availability may be a problem on top of that uh, sometime late last month you know the the government because of the limited number of tests available uh, just took out this dictate the hospitals can't insist on covid test before treatment but then soon the uh, good counsel prevailed and this was followed up and by an advisory that you must test all patients getting hospital admissions um, for covid testing and uh, this is the reason uh, they said that the patients have to undergo rt pcr when they are getting admitted to the hospital that's because you know we have a large number of patients who may be asymptomatic and uh, these guidelines um, make sure that you know in outpatient you must observe all the precautions which you are uh, observing in the inpatient and even in outpatient all the suspected cases must undergo testing and uh, 
because about 69% of the patients in India who are affected may have no symptoms or very mild symptoms, they are likely to report to work or they are likely to uh, come to the hospital for consultation for other diseases and can potentially infect the healthcare workers. This is a paper we published just uh, three days back and we talked about the management of orthopedic residents during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what you see on your right side is actually, uh, we have converted the entire resident pool into four groups. The four teams are A, B, C, and D, each of 25%. 25 uh, residents are put on COVID duty with another 25% being reserved. Then they exchange places with the A after some time. And then A and D team exchange swap with B and C who are actually looking after the wards and the, and the other patients in the meantime. This is uh, from Mohit Bhandari's group, Best Practices for Surgeons 2.0 came out on April 22nd. And I think essentially what it says is that all the consultations should be telemedicine uh, and teleconsultations as far as possible. It let's put a lot of onus on the surgical team to work with the other care providers to make sure that only the most essential surgeries are done and the routine surgeries are best avoided. Now, the problem is that this is from... WHO yesterday, uh, it came the newspaper yesterday said that the COVID may never go away and we all are increasingly, increasingly realizing that we have to live with the COVID. So in that situation, when do we start opening up? When do we start the outpatient? When do we start the, uh, the wards? Because we don't know when the pandemic will end. So some of the suggestions are when a large portion of the society has acquired immunity, when the pathogen has uh, mutated sufficiently to become non-violent, when there's an effective treatment against disease or an effective vaccine, or, you know, you start showing a downward trend and then you stop getting the new cases, at least uh, in India. So the mandate to allow return to elective surgery has been issued by uh, some governmental authorities then but then uh, the because it is believed that you know the other diseases are likely to kill many more people than the corona for example in india the tuberculosis the road traffic accident they kill more people than corona but then the prerequisite is that uh, you have to get into an area separate from the covid 19 because you do not want to become an infection amplifier uh, as a hospital. You should have adequate supply of uh, PPEs and testing kits. You must have social distancing and you must be adequately prepared for a second potential wave. So ideal situation, a sustain, like I said, a sustained reduction in rate of new cases, appropriate decontamination of the hospital and necessary equipment and trained and educated staff available. Ideally, all the people who are working in these times or regularly must be tested for SARS-CoV-2 and uh, or they should have tested positive on antibody and because that would mean that they have already been exposed and are immunized and would make them somewhat safe uh, to work for themselves and for uh, the patient. And then, of course, it's, it says two pathways, but we have re realized that we have three pathways, but two of them are in one area. So what we need is we need a separate surgical block for two categories of patients. And like I said, the main aims right now is looking after the non-COVID patients and the suspects. They are tested. If they are tested negative, they continue to get treatment in the main hospital. So a portion or a section of the main hospital is converted into COVID suspect. We have another building, but we are not using that for COVID suspect because it would entail using a lot of manpower. But... But then, if required, we will go there if you have a huge number of suspects. But as of now, this is a place for COVID negative. And once you, anybody is COVID positive, comes to this hospital, which I've been heading uh, for last uh, three years, from a center, we have trauma services, like I said in my last talk. And this 260 bedded hospital, trauma hospital, has got oxygen and manifold on every bed and has got about. Um, 70 ICU bed with capability to convert another 70 into ICU beds because uh, we if we, we have ventilators but then uh, we need the uh, the expert manpower for that now who should go for elective surgery 
a patient ideally for uh, for elective surgery is one who has had covid and has recovered including the 14 days of quarantine and absence of other symptoms because that would ensure that he doesn't catch the infection in the hospital now elective surgery for elderly must be deferred if they are more than 75 if they are morbidly obese diabetic uncontrolled hypertension chronic pulmonary disease obstructive sleep apnea chronic heart disease or immunocompromised state and we should offer surgical procedures to patients with comorbidities only for emergent or urgent conditions such as severely painful or loose implant infection impending fracture fracture soft tissue compromise and similar condition to to uh, name a few now risk stratification is important dedicated theater is a must separate facilities is a must intensive testing is required and then this is the catch you should not ideally be doing too many surgeries or perhaps no surgeries where the patient will require icu in the post operative period simply because you might need the icu facility for your covid positive patient so uh, even if we start i think we'll have to restrict ourselves to those cases which are not likely to go to icu or likely to need blood now this is a flow chart which shows if a patient in an outpatient clinic is uh, recognized to have indication for elective surgery you must look at the risk factor now if there are risk factors uh, which are the and the comorbidities are substantial you should try to defer surgery you should also try to defer surgery if the if the complaints of patients do not outweigh the risk of surgery so those patients where the complaints outweigh the risk and the patient has no com comorbidities uh, possibly that those are the kind of case patients which can be taken up it's absolutely necessary to educate the patient preemptively you should tell them that they should have limited number of attendants social distancing has to be observed the expected pre operative and post operative course must be discussed the hospital patients all patients coming to hospital must wear a mask and observe hand hygiene no eating in restricted area patient should avoid the use of common spaces spaces or services and bedside check in is encouraged rather than asking the patient to go to different windows for the admission process before admission information or te pocc is a must that means travel occupation contact and cluster ideally patient should have had an rt pcr test uh, within 3 to 7 days of the prior to the elective surgery and then the family members of pediatric patients especially must be screened for virus before the pediatric surgery a single room is always preferable but if it's a common room there should be adequate distance and commonly touched surfaces must be wiped down and cleaned at least twice a day with sodium hypochlorite or 70% alcohol a screening ward for house patients patients like i said especially those who may not have been tested pre operatively and then there are suggestions that you can use hepa filters in relatively crowded room or area now this is a tracking app launched by government of india and that could be one way to uh, to sort of screen your patients a green digital health code and one negative rt pcr test prior to admission would be desirable now screening for covid covid would include for all patients who are coming to hospital is to record temperature preferably even pulse oximetry if it was possible look for the series of questions to stratify into various risk groups and again like i said the tocc information is the patient coming from high prevalence of covid-19 does he have uh, occupation with high risk of covid-19 like a healthcare worker or uh, contacts of infected patient or cro close proximity to positive patient and this is just what you all know the frequency of different symptoms uh, in covid intraoperatively a ventilation system which should have uh, 100% fresh air if possible a minimum of 20 air changes per hour reduce the number of equipment and install filters that can remove aerosol and droplets such as hepa filters now if you have a patient who's confirmed negative and you do something like an arthroplasty there may be some uh, uh, some uh, argument for normal positive pressure in contrast to the covid positive surgeries where it is recommended that patient should have negative pressure and you must use modalities to decrease efflux of contaminated air into hallways such as in room air filters and negative pressure anti chamber um, minimize the number of people in the operating rooms especially during intubation and more than intubation at extubation when the aerosol generation is maximum the most preferred anesthesia is local anesthesia the most preferred surgery is the is the short stay or the day care surgery avoid laminar air flow and like i said you know the uh, the air conditioning is very important 
the uh, HEPA filter systems are extremely important to remove the viral particles. The uh, surgeon must scrub frequently, must change respirators every six to eight hours, and definitely have a new one every day. Now, for COVID positive and COVID suspect cases, must have N95 masks, COVID goggles, blue balaclava, and face shield. For non-COVID-19 high aerosol, you know, uh, you can use these. These are beautiful masks. I think they are mainly used by orthopedic surgeons. The orange masks, which are tape sealed, have a blue balaclava, standard eye protection, and a face shield. But a simple surgery in non-COVID, orange mask, tape sealed, balaclava, and standard eye protection. We should avoid surgical helmets because they are difficult to sterilize and then actually can harbor viruses in between the helmets. Uh, if the if the hospital standard protocol for total joint arthroplasty exists, it should be continued with appropriate disinfection protocols in place and an N95 mask must always be worn in addition to using the helmet. Uh, minimum use of power tool, reaming system, suction irrigation reaming, consider use very carefully and power tools we know disturb airflow and transmit infectious droplets. Do not use pulse lava, generation of vapors may increase risk of transmitting infectious agent and uh, there's no reason to use it in most cases. It is said that you must uh, uh, vigorously suck all the smoke from the electrocautery because that is suspected to give right, to have the um, virus particles. The wound closure material must be subcuticular buried. All knots should be under the skin. It should be absorbable. There should be a visible dressing. Avoid uh, wool crepe uh, coverage. Use back slap so that if you use a full slap cast and the swelling occurs, you don't have to open it and have a uh, repeat procedure in a positive patient. Limited the number of people in the operation theater. Reduce door opening in the operation theater. Keep the equipment, like I said, to the minimum. Don't use those hi-fi. Don't conduct those hi-fi surgeries which need uh, these equipment. Keep the power settings to as low as possible when the power tools are being used. Try to use things like old-fashioned gilly saw, sharp astrotome, or manual reaming whenever possible. The standard recommendation of cleaning and sterilization of instruments must uh, are enough but must be treated adequately uh, important thing is that you must clean them immediately gross soiling must be removed and immediately and soaking contaminated items in enzyme solution should be avoided because that can form uh, a layer which can uh, retain the uh, virus particles the operation room cleaning must be thoroughly done after every case the uh, contact time for disinfectant should be from four to more than 10 minutes. And uh, at the end of the day, it's good if you have an ultraviolet light and 20 minutes of air cycling operating room fitted with efficient ventilation system can remove aerosolized virus particles. Use of multiple operation theater rooms is preferred and uh, you, uh, you must uh, have personal cleansing procedures in between the, uh, in between the procedures. The recovery room must have adequate distancing between patients appropriate mask at all time, minimize the stay there in the perioperative period, overcrowding and non-essential personnel must be kept out, and patients who could not be extubated in the operating room should be shifted straight to ICU, bypassing the PAKU. You should not keep them in PAKU, and then the surfaces must be cleaned regularly, as earlier said earlier. Reduce the need for radiographs. Take it inside the theater on fluoroscopy. Avoid... Uh, uh, the uh, machine and the radiographer uh, with a portable machine going there in the post-operative period. There's no change in thromboprophylaxis, same as pre-COVID times. Post-operative care, try to minimize the hospital stay. Uh, post-operative round should be on telemedicine whenever possible. Self-directed physical therapy at home is pre preferable. And again, the post-discharge visit should be by telemedicine. So uh, limited clinic uh, visits, the only for uh, some serious issues or complications, and then social distancing has to be followed at home for them. They have to be instructed. NSAIDs are safe. No evidence against NSAIDs at this point of time. So to summarize, these are testing times. We have to slowly start them and then build up. Uh, so it's like said that the long distance runners start slowly. Be vigilant. Safety of the patient and the surgeon is paramount. Minimize the patient's stay. Continuous update is a must. These are some of the updates which are available and these are some of the references but then while we are trying to flatten the curve for covid i think there are other responsibility the social responsibility where we have to uh, you know be a participant and maybe a guide to policy makers to reduce and flatten the other curves as well and remember it can be very dangerous
to believe and spread the rumors because you it could easily get you into the hit list thank you very much for your attention rajesh thank you fantastic and elaborate and very precise i know that there are a lot of points that you have given us and definitely it's going to be picked up and then discussed further and uh, there are going to be uh, questions coming from the chat room as well and uh, there are questions which are already lined up and uh, without taking much time i would like to bring on our uh, very dear friend everett smith from bristol uk he is a designer him surgeon himself and uh, been uh, with nhs now he is doing the private work i don't know whether the nhs has pulled him back to the covid work uh, uh, everett are you ready with your slides or are you going to be doing the question answer session Everett, are you there? Yeah, I don't. I don't have a presentation for you today. Okay, fantastic. Then we'll move on, and then we will get on to the uh, next. Anand, are you having any presentations? You can unmute yourself, Anand, and then uh, let us know if you have any presentations. Looks like you're sitting in a garden, so I don't think you have one, probably. No, there, there no presentation. I'm back inside the house now. Hey, um, great, wonderful, wonderful. Now, now, Ajibola, do you have any presentations to share and share? No, I don't. I don't. I'll fantastic, be taking fantastic. the question and answer session. Fantastic, great. Uh, Vivek has uh, told me and messaged me that he's going to be taking question and answers. And uh, let us see. Uh, we definitely are going to be looking for Andrews. Before that, Anthony, do you have anything to present? Anthony, you there? Anthony? Yeah. You're having any presentations to make, or are you going um, to be? I, I, I have a couple of slides I could show. Um, Fantastic. Get on, yeah. then. We will, we will get on. So, for people who are not familiar with Anthony, uh, Anthony uh, Johansson, uh, Johansson is the uh, co-author of the nice guidelines from the UK, the blue book, we all follow and we all take it forward. And he is from uh, Cardiff University uh, Hospital from Wales, uh, Cardiff. Anthony, you're on. Okay. Um, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the national register that we have in the UK, which collects data on every patient who presents with hip fracture. Uh, and I talked a lot about what that's done for the way in which we provide hip fracture in the UK. Uh, but sort of started to suggest how it might be able to use routine data collection as a way of understanding COVID because COVID is going to be the biggest change that hip fracture care ever sees. So for every patient who presents with a hip fracture in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we ask information about case mix, about the, the care that people get, and then we examine the outcome. And uh, just two weeks ago, we started uh, collecting information about people's coronavirus status, looking at whether they were positive when they came into hospital, um, whether they became positive after being in hospital, or whether they managed to pass through hospital without being positive at any time. And we're over the course of uh, two weeks since we spoke, we've had 3,000 patients. Uh, so we've got 3,000 patients data al already. Um, and that allows us to, to have a look at some simple things like that. So th these data are not, are not up to date and they're not completely accurate, but they give you a sense of what we can start to see um, for our patients. So you can see that the vast majority of people don't have coronavirus. Uh, they, are, they may be at risk, but they don't get it during their time in hospital. And their care in hospital is influenced by the effect coronavirus has had on the hospital. Um, and on the way that services have been um, uh, affected, as we've just heard in that, in that last lovely lecture. Um, but they're not, they're not themselves infected. And you can imagine that that, that uh, has huge implications for the future. We can look at how individual hospitals um, treat people as well. And while pretty much 98% uh, of people in the UK normally would have surgery for hip fracture uh, and non-operative management is confined to people with impacted uh, intracapsular fracture um, or people who die before they can get to theatre. Um, over the time since coronavirus has happened, the, the blue area are the hospitals where a, a substantial proportion of patients are having non-operative management. 
and that's I think a reflection of the stress that there's been on the uh, on hospital services. So these are people who in general don't have coronavirus uh, but are getting non-operative management because the hospital hasn't coped with the stresses that we've just heard a lecture about. Uh, we have very simple guidelines, uh, much less comprehensive than the guidelines that, uh, that you've circulated in the UK, talking about some of the technical issues and arguing for aggressive active care. But we have a lot of information that we need to collect um, and the National Hip Fracture Database can collect some of that. We can look at some aspects of, of care, but our approach is very much around what happens in different hospitals and comparing how hospitals work and looking for the detail of what might happen to individual patients and what other information that we might know need to know about individual patients, their blood tests, their swab results, um, and how they present and how they become unwell is something that needs work beyond what the register can do. And that's something that uh, Andrew Hall uh, is trying to do in the impact study about which he's going to talk. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the most awaited uh, 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 chap today is going to be Andrew. Andrew is a young, energetic and bubbling figure in the UK and Scotland the government, Scotland NHS, Kirkaldi, he's working in. And uh, we are going to be bringing him back. Uh, he's the star of the event today as well. Uh, others as well. I'm not uh, uh, discouraging or, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't worry about that. So, Andrew, if you have the slides to share, are you ready with that? Absolutely, yes. Well, thank you very much for the really kind introduction and also for that uh, fantastic prelude by Dr. Johansson there, uh, whose work we've looked up to for so long in Scotland. I will share my screen now. Hopefully you can see my screen here. We can, and we can go on the slideshow. We will be able to. Okay. So what I'd like to bring your attention to today um, is the impact collaborative research, which we've set up. Uh, it's a collaborative research project, which is supported by the Scottish government, the Scottish hip fracture audit and sort it the Scottish orthopedic research trust into trauma. Uh, we are a set of researchers predominantly from the Royal infirmary in Edinburgh. Uh, and we have set up an emergency research response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's multiple aspects to impact. At the core of impact is our um, masthead of um, hip fracture audit, followed by a services survey and also a um, virtual summit, which we'll be hosting most likely at the beginning of June. As you can see here, uh, we've reached many corners of the world already, over five continents. This is actually out of date by about 48 hours. We've already added multiple further countries. Uh, Mexico just have emailed back in the process of this meeting, would you believe? So I hope to be able to add plenty more international collaborators through the course of this session and beyond. So please do get in touch with us if you find anything here interesting today. So as I said, with IMPACT, what we are doing is setting up an IMPACT hip fracture audit an impact services survey and our impact virtual summit. You Andrew, can go Andrew, over the Andrew, Andrew, I'm going to stop you here. Are you doing the per mean, uh, per PowerPoint presentation because you're still stuck on the screen there? Uh, you so, can do. One moment. You can start the slideshow. Can you see my slides now? Uh, we are able to see your screen. I'm, I'm but sharing, the sharing, the de sharing the desktop. Yeah, we are able to see the des uh, the screen, but it is not on the slideshow mode. Yes, I, I'd prefer, if, if possible, just to share this desktop. Um, I've got okay. a number of things on the desktop which I'd like oh, to share. Oh, great. Okay, okay, great. Go on then, go on then. I'll not disturb okay. you. Uh, so you can go ahead over to our website, which is trauma.co.uk forward slash impact. Now, this is um, where we have the wealth of information pertaining to impact. You can also find this on the Twitter account we have, which is at Impact Audits. That's at Impact Audits. I'd more than happily see your participation on there with the conversations we've been having. Now, as I've said, the Impact Projects uh, is the banner over which uh, we have three main themes, the Impact Hip Fracture Audit, 
which is a clinical collaborative audit that is now spanning five different continents and will investigate and is continuing to investigate a hip fracture epidemiology, the incidence of COVID, the outcomes of patients with COVID, and also to identify any clinical features which may be predictive of um, outcomes in COVID to help with service delivery and of clinical planning. Our impact services survey is an online survey which is available on SurveyMonkey in English, but also is available for dissemination and translation if required into a number of different languages. And this assesses the impact of COVID-19 on all aspects of trauma and orthopedics, looking at general orthopedics with elective services and assessing the disruption there, as well as strategies which might mitigate against disruption uh, and a planned recovery period and the concerns that many of us may have. But also it, I've outlined the disruption to trauma and uh, trauma orthopedics, particularly with respect to fragility fracture and hip fracture care. This would be an absolutely fantastic and vital opportunity to provide context within which we can interpret the data from the impact hip fracture audit. Finally, the impact virtual summit uh, completes our uh, trilogy of um, research uh, activities within impact, and that will be hosted at the beginning of June um, on the platforms owned by the Bone and Joint Journal, the BJJ in Britain. And that Uh, we'll go out a live interview with uh, Mr. Andrew Duckworth, uh, who is a uh, trauma and orthopedic surgeon and researcher from Edinburgh, who will be interviewing some key people from around the world, generating what will be a truly multinational global picture on the disruption to uh, hip fracture services. I'll just switch over now to show you our impact hip fracture audit um, dashboard here. Now, this is um, what can be um, disseminated to anybody who is interested. We would like to get a truly diverse group of individuals participating in this. We have a data collection tool, which is now active in dozens of hospitals around the world and over five continents, which is a clinical audit of patient information, comorbidities, bloods which may be predictive of outcomes, surgical details, and of discharge and mortality details. And to date, we are collecting hundreds and now into the thousands of patient data lines, which will give us a um, wonderful picture of the uh, impact of COVID-19 on hip fracture. Now, I would like to stress that I'd like to invite anybody who is interested and able to collect data pertaining to hip fracture within the COVID period that they can contact us and our email address is available. I can just show it onto the screen here. You can contact me directly at andrew.hall15 at nhs.net. All data is anonymized. There is no need to transfer patient identifiable information. Your units will not be identifiable directly from the publicly available data. And all data can be submitted to a secure mailbox within the Scottish government who are hosting a secure um, data point for us to collect any sensitive information whatsoever. Now, this is a collaborative research project. We are incredibly grateful for the generosity and the collegiate spirit that we've received from around the world with people participating. But we would like to stress that anybody who contributes to the impact project will be acknowledged within the co-authorship as well. I'd like to show you some of our initial results. Now, what I would like to show you here is, is fairly sensitive because we will be um, publishing this very soon in most likely the Bone and Joint Journal, um, but it's just a teaser of what's available. We've developed some uh, brand new um, uh, data sets from the first six co-collaborating um, units, which are six units within Scotland. Uh, what we have found in a study of a uh, high quality study of 300 patients is that 30 day mortality is three or fourfold increased in patients who are positive with COVID. As you can see here, this gray line is the Kaplan-Meier curve of survival for 30 days for patients who are not affected by COVID infection in the context of hip fracture. And the black line refers to patients who have COVID and hip fracture and are admitted to one of our units. And as you can see, the mortality. Andrew, your graph's not moving. Your tabletop's not moving. Okay, can you, you can see the graph, can you? 
Uh, it's there. It's there, but it's not the graph. It's just the table we are able to see. Sorry. Uh, One second. Let me try. Is that moving on your screen? It is moving on my screen. So I'll just have to describe it for the for, for the people who can't see it. I'm afraid. Unless anybody has any suggestions. Uh, what I'm currently looking at is a Kaplan-Meier curve. Can you see that? To stop screen sharing and start again. Um, or, or, or start, Andrew, because of the network. The yeah, correct, correct, Anthony. What you can do is you can also stop your video so the network gets better probably, the bandwidth gets better for you. Brilliant. Yeah, no, Perfect. brilliant. Yeah, we got that. There we go. Fantastic. Yeah. So what we have here is the Kaplan-Meier curve for 30-day survival, and we've um, divided two groups of patients. The gray group here are hip fracture patients who are admitted to hospital and do not have COVID-19 infection throughout their stay. Their mortality at 30 days um, is equivalent to what we would usually see, which is 8.3%, uh, uh, as you can see here. 91.7% of these people are alive at 30 days. Now, if you look at the second line here, this is hip fracture patients who are admitted and at some point in their admission uh, suffer uh, or demonstrate the um, features of COVID infection. Now the survival drops down to 66.7% at 30 days, which is a fourfold increase in the mortality at 30 days, which is associated with COVID-19 infection. Has demonstrated that uh, age adjusted mortality is a threefold increase. And what we went on to investigate was represented in this Kaplan-Meier curve here, which hopefully you can see, is a 30-day survival curve for three groups of patients. Still in gray is the group of patients who do not have COVID infection during hip fracture. The black line here is patients who were admitted with hip fracture and on admission demonstrated signs of COVID infection. And the third line, the dashed line, is patients who were admitted with COVID with hip fracture did not demonstrate on admission any signs of COVID infection, but later went on to develop COVID. And the inference here is actually that these patients may well have contracted COVID infection during their hospital stay. It is actually pertaining to the majority of COVID patients, which is quite concerning for, for the, the perspective of infection control within hospitals. But going back to this curve, what it does demonstrate is a significant increase in mortality for patients who are admitted with hip fracture and COVID on admission, and their survival is right down at 50% at 30 days. And the dashed line, what it does show is a lag whereby once the patient does demonstrate clinical signs of COVID infection, their deterioration and their survival for this group of patients is following a similar curve to the patients who are admitted with COVID as well. Now that is particularly concerning given that we need to control the inpatient spread of patient-to-patient -patient and staff-to-patient infection. The final graph I'd like to show you is a rock curve. Now, throughout the analysis, which unfortunately you did get a brief, um, a, a brief introduction to whilst I was missharing my screen, um, is that we found an association, a strong association between low platelet count and COVID-19 infection. Now we gathered information about platelet count because of an understanding of the COVID-19 infection in all patients, not just hip fracture, that it does demonstrate a, a strong association with uh, thrombocytopenia. Indeed, the picture appears to be a consumptive thrombocytopenia in a prothrombotic group of patients. So further analysis demonstrated that low platelet count was an independent predictor independent of um, age and sex for COVID-19 infection. And at a point of a threshold level of 217, um, the platelet count demonstrates a sensitivity and specificity of near 70% for COVID-19 infection. Now this uh, was for all comers, not just people who were positive with COVID infection at admission, but also those who went on to develop COVID infection and may well be found to be a useful predictor of uh, potential patient outcomes. So I'd like to stress there that mortality during COVID-19 infection during hip fracture is significantly increased. Now that's a fourfold increase for all patients and a, 
three times increase on the age adjusted model. However, it is important to, uh, to recognize that three quarters of hip fracture patients with COVID are still alive at 30 days. Now that's important because we've had some slightly rogue centers who have suggested it may well be possible to manage hip fracture non-operatively in a more frequent um, manner if these patients have COVID infection because the, uh, the early suggestions were that COVID-19 infection would likely be unsurvivable in hip fracture patients. Clearly that is not the case. Um, we would argue that there is no evidence to um, have a broad brush policy of non-operative management of hip fracture patients who have COVID, because I would like to stress again, these people do survive beyond 30 days and ought to be given the best chance of a surgical outcome. So just to summarize, we have a fantastic opportunity with a global um, network of uh, now, I think, 30 countries over five continents. We would like to invite people to participate in our hip fracture audit. We would implore people to contribute to the um, online virtual uh, the services survey, but also to take a look at trauma.co.uk forward slash impact because we will be having an impact online content uh, to which we would be incredibly grateful for people to provide blog report style uh, feedback, um, which we do hope to serialize and to publish in journal as well. So I'd like to take any questions. Great, uh, thanks Andrew. It, it, it's, it's been really, really uh, interesting and uh, we look forward to uh, participate in the trial. And as you rightly said, it's been started in March. And then I, I at this juncture, I would like to get uh, Anthony. Anthony, thank you. Thank you for getting Andrew here for us. So it, it's going to be great help for us. And then between the two uh, uh, you know, continents, we will definitely share all our documents and uh, take it forward for the data, which is extremely important because we learn from each other and then uh, we that's the way we move forward. Now, there are questions for the panelists. All the panelists are ready, and uh, you guys can unmute and probably take the questions. Uh, one, uh, Rajesh has summarized, in fact, uh, for all the speakers, in fact, what and how the COVID is uh, done for us and then the evolving uh, uh, trend that we have in our orthopedic practice. One question, uh, Rajesh, I want to ask you probably, I think IOA brought this, and then there are a lot of other issues which we also discussed on that point, uh, both in other seminar, I mean, other webinars as well. You said, do not use laminar flow, if I'm correct. Uh, is that right? That's what you said in your slides? Yeah. Any particular I reason, Rajesh? That. You did. So uh, the, the problem is, you know, the... Uh, in a laminar flow in a normal situation, you are actually driving the air away from patient. And here, you are actually likely to contaminate from the patient sources, cause more droplets or aerosols, and uh, actually more, uh, there's more likelihood of infecting or aerosolizing or contaminating the environment more. So that's the reason why See, normally, like in arthroplasty, we, we want everything away from the patient, right? But here, the com everything coming from the patient to the periphery may be contaminated. That's why you should not have positive pressure in a confirmed COVID patient, and you should not have a laminar airflow. Because this is one point which is very, very contradictory to the lot of guidelines which has come in uh, throughout the world. I would like uh, uh, probably the orthopedic surgeons from UK. Evert is there. I think Evert has been in our faculty and we discussed this at length. Evert, do you have something to say on that? We still have laminar flow in Bristol, but we have vertical laminar flow. But what uh, Rajesh is saying in terms of principles, you certainly don't want the flow of air coming from the patient out into the theater complex. But we've been quite careful in maintaining uh, vertical laminar flow, and we've kept on with laminar flow throughout this time in our acute patients, our trauma patients. So we haven't got rid of laminar flow entirely. Uh, this is positive pressure laminar flow, yeah. and it is entirely, and, and, and most of yeah. the- and it's yeah. vertical. 
That's the point. It's vertical laminar flow. Great. Anand, do you want to comment something on that? Well, our guidelines are fairly straightforward. We don't uh, use negative pressure. We have, there are two things. One is the theater itself is positively pressurized. And then you have the vertical laminar flow, which is the second uh, factor. And our guidelines are fairly clear that we don't change this. We don't switch off initially in the first two or three days. There was some conflicting information about switching off the laminar flow, but leaving the positive pressure on, leaving the positive, you know, uh, switching the positive pressure off and just using laminar flow. So it goes into the concept of where does the bug live? Unless you have an aerosol generating procedure, which is intubation and extubation, in which case you use your FFP3 personal protection um, and all the other things that Rajesh has very eloquently stated, the risks diminish as you move further away from the center of the infective focus, which is a patient. And for us, it is uh, right across the country, we do not switch off either the laminar flow or the positive pressure within the theater rooms. And that's right across the United Kingdom. So clearly we have, we are all learning as we go along. And um, it may be that um, Rajesh will be proved right. But for us, the guidance is that this is what we should do and we all do it. I think I think I agree with you. I mean, yeah, definitely the guidelines are going to be the mainstay for all of us. And then let's see what, uh, uh, you know, Ajibola from uh, Nigeria have to say on that. Ajibola, are you there? Ajibola from uh, Ibadan University in Nigeria. Uh, Ajibola, you are missing? Are you there? Anish, is it, is it muted or what is the problem there? Ah, they can hear you yeah, now. He's unmuted now. He's okay, unmuted thank now. you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, um, for those of our centers that have um, the laminar flow, we have continued using our laminar flow, although what we have done in Nigeria is that we have drastically reduced the number of cases we're taking. We take only the emergencies. We're no longer taking routine cases. We take only emergencies. We don't have the luxury of screening patients before surgery yet. So we assume that every patient who comes in is positive. So we take precautions. Essentially, the things that have been mentioned earlier, reduce the number of people in theater at intubation and extubation. The anesthetists protect themselves. We reduce aerosol generation as possible. We suck the smoke from the diatomy. But We've, for the centers that have a laminar flow, we have continued using a laminar flow. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Mazia from Egypt, uh, you have anything to add a comment on that, uh, Dr. Mazia? Yes, we have to consider the international recommendation regarding this laminar flow. Many country doesn't have the laminar flow or even start the laminar flow and it changed it. it to not to be used anymore. So if it is adding a positive chance for contamination, especially for the operating staff, the professor, the doctor, the nurses, uh, these are valuable uh, advice to be considered and stop the laminar flu in corona patient to protect the staff and protect the next patient who will come to the same season. Vivek, uh, are you there? Could you? Um, I am a little, not little, very concerned about laminar air. I know we are trying to reduce the infection. The, the infection we all read about, read all these days, other ways. Um, Thoughts look like nothing in front of the uh, monstrous bug we are facing now. So, I, I don't think this is a time to uh, kind of uh, hy hypothesize. I would lean more towards being on a safer side. And for people who are using laminar flow and insist to use laminar flow, I think um, we should modify the patient situation because most of the aerosol is coming from uh, the head end. So uh, like we have seen in the past webinars, the head part of the patient is contained 
in his own chamber and uh, so it's cut off from the exposure to the lamellar flow or to the to the air of the um, OR uh, that's uh, that's in a way is protecting the uh, surgeon's patient and also we we are uh, kind of not only putting to danger the people in the room, it is going to go through the whole OR complex. And uh, some people may take uh, uh, consolation in this, oh, we have tested the patient and so we are, we are okay. Um, there are studies coming out uh, which says um, being a COVID negative for a patient can be false positive or false negative as we all know. Uh, so you can't uh, hang our hat on that. So I, 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 somebody should take up the study if people are insisting on laminar flow. And then if there's another thing we can find a solution in this is um, the, the air which circulates has to go through a modified HEPA filter so make it whole safe. These are all kind of defensive uh, things you can apply, but and, and we, have, we, we know there's not much of a difference between regular OR and a laminar airflow. So question to all those people who are using laminar airflow, why are you guys insisting so much and putting yourself and the people in the whole OR complex into danger? Right, that's my question. Who wants to answer that? Any faculty? I mean, I think we don't know the answer. It's as simple as that. I mean, that's why that's why we don't use it. No, no, that's not that's not an answer. If you want to decide something, you should actually arrange a scientific evaluation that might be risking the patients. But there's no suggestion, as we've heard from Andrew, there's no suggestion in the UK and our acute patients in Bristol that we've in fact done any worse because of our laminar flow issues. And everybody's continued along that way. I mean, as a country, we haven't done that well in terms of coronavirus, but we haven't seen any changes in the six or seven weeks because of the way we've used laminar flow. We have to have proof of the pudding before we stop it. I think I, think I agree with you, uh, uh, Edward. Rajesh and Vivek had a point there, and then definitely uh, in that true center term, the, the kind of theater what we have in India, I think Rajesh is working in a five-star, seven-star uh, uh, hotel, sorry, the hospital, I was, sorry, Rajesh, hospital of the kind of setup, and I said seven-star kind of a hotel facility. You have got a fantastic, one of the premier institute in the country, and that kind of facility is not enjoyed by the rest of the folks that we are doing in our private practice or not in the institutions. In many of the operation theaters, we have the regular air conditioners. And now with a lot of discussions, we have also put in the guidelines that we can have our air ionizers. We've had a, a session with a couple of sessions, in fact, with the, the virologist who is, uh, you know, of uh, Pasteur Institute uh, trained. And he, he very well suggested, if you do not have, or even if you have a laminar flow, the suggestion what he gave us was, then once the, the, you know, the virus or the aerosol, infective uh, aerosol is going to be coming onto the flow or spreading onto the air, if it's getting ionized, and then that is going to be literally killing the virus and the activity further to something like about 80 to 90%, he says. And that's the study which has been done. So, I, I, I mean, keeping that in mind in a balance, uh, if somebody has a horizontal or, or a, one kind of a uh, laminar flow coming from a head end, like what Vivek was talking about, most of the laminar flows in India have that uh, the right from the vertical one, which is in the series of, in, in the inner circle of the patient, uh, the OR table itself. And as you move on, as rightly said by Ever, the infection gets much, much lesser. And the proof of pudding, obviously, I think I will accept that. I think we could look at that having a point of research. I, Amar, 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 not, I have a question on that. So uh, just just because, like Ever says, I know if, you, if nothing is changing, why change? So we are dealing with a different kind of bug here. We, how, how, how do these institutions come to a conclusion? There's no increased chances of infection. You know this, and by now, um, even if the patient is infected, we, they're not following these patients 
every week, every month, if they are positive or negative, they get the treatment and they go home. There's nothing in place to say they are, have been infected or not infected. Let's see if they're infected and 80% of the patients, as we know, they don't show symptoms and they're not gonna to come to the hospital. So how are we jumping to a conclusion that uh, there's no increased incidence of uh, infection if they are not regularly followed and tested every week? Highly impossible to know there is a uh, increased infection rate among the personnel, among everything, because we don't know where they have contracted it. So we cannot blame or unblame a procedure or the way we do things. Agreed. Okay, now, can I just say something there? Yeah, go on. So the flip side of what has just been said by our American colleague is that uh, the absence of evidence doesn't prove to be evidence itself. So I, I speak to some colleagues who are working in New York, which doesn't have a brilliant uh, uh, record of uh, uh, low infection rates either. And they have converted some of their theaters to negative airflow, and there is no significant difference either way. And the big question here is, if you look at the study by Tim Meek that was published in the Health Services Journal, um, there are two papers. One was about three or four weeks ago, looking at who the healthcare workers were who, who got infected with COVID and what the mortality rates were. The findings are very significant. Not a single anesthetist or intensivist has died of COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. One anesthetic nurse has unfortunately passed away about four days ago. And if you compare that to the 19 medics who have died, the answer seems to be the transmission appears to be patient to patient and staff to staff rather than patient to staff and vice versa, though no doubt that occurs the data suggests that this tends to be more in the community. And if you look at theaters, you'll find that the, the behavior of surgical personnel in theater is largely the same as it was before uh, this crisis began. After you finish operating on a case with your lead and all your PPE, you tend to go and make yourself a cup of coffee and you pass each other within one or two feet of each other. And though the chairs are spaced six foot apart, you can see people talking to each other within a foot and we don't wear any PPE. The people who have been affected most are those who have had face-to-face -face dealings with patients within three feet with no PPE. So the key boils down to, and the interesting thing, as I said, is not a single anesthetist or intensivist has died of COVID-19 in the United Kingdom because they have been using FFP3 from the beginning for all patients. So that seems to be the weak point. And it is the availability and the use of P appropriate PPE, not necessarily FFP3 masks for everyone, the use of appropriate PPE in the appropriate situation that has been missing in the beginning of our attempts to deal with this in the UK that has led to such a high incidence. I have a question for Andrew Hall. And one of them is, Fantastic presentation, and I think I'm really going to look forward to reading your paper in the BJJ. The question really is, have you looked at COVID mortality in your three groups according to ethnicity? That's a fascinating, um, fascinating question, because we do know in the UK what we could term BAME, Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups uh, do tend to, um, to fare worse. In fairness, in Scotland, our ethnicity is majority white Scottish, uh, and I think that is a, um, a really important reason why we need to increase the diversity as much as possible and the um, number of um, and the geographical spread of people who are collecting with our impact study. Actually, can I come back to that? And I think um, Rajesh and our colleague from Ain Shams in Egypt uh, and also our colleague from Nigeria would so the, the death patterns that we are seeing and the mortality in places like India, Africa, the Middle East are completely different to those affecting the BAME population in the United Kingdom. And the theory really is, is it a different strain? Is it that the immunity of the BAME community who migrate to the United Kingdom after a certain period of time reverts to a lower level? And that would be fascinating to look at the ethnicity figures in the United Kingdom um, 
compared and comparing their mortality with those of similar ethnic groups in other parts of the world. And I think your study has great potential and I, I, I would encourage everyone to, to participate in it from around the world. Thank you very much, that's a fascinating contribution. Thank you, thank you. Any comments on this question, uh, panelists? Could, could, could I say? Um, yeah, yeah, well, definitely, I'm, Anthony. I'm probably the, the only physician uh, part of this conversation, but my, my general rule about um, surgeons and orthopedic surgeons is that they, they always know what is right and that they are doing what is right. Uh, but when you collect information from all of the orthopedic surgeons in the UK, you find they, they may all be right, but they're all doing different things. And it's only when you start looking at how practice varies between hospitals and structure how you collect that information that you start to learn from other hospitals in your country. And I've done a lot of work around the world in comparing the national registers from different countries. And what we think is right in the UK is just completely different from what is happening in other countries. Uh, and we can't all be right, uh, but we can learn from each other. And the only way to learn from each other is by sharing data. So Andrew's study allows me in my hospital to put information or to give one of my trainees um, the job of putting information into a website that will allow me to compare what's happening in my hospital to my patients with what's happening in Bristol, in London, in Scotland, but potentially in, in other countries around the world. Uh, countries where they've been on top of COVID. Uh, we heard from China yesterday, it's very impressive what happening in Beijing, where nobody in, in Beijing is getting COVID. How that's happened, it's a completely different world. Um, but the amount that we could learn from India um, and India could learn from us is enormous. And this is a very simple way of doing that. And for, for India, India, we were talking um, two weeks ago about how the National Register in the UK would be really useful. You don't have a National Register in India. It will be horribly difficult to get a National Register like the NHFD in India. But impact is very much the start of that process. To get hospitals sharing information and collaborating and starting to look at things in the same way would be an enormous step forward for India, for Japan, for for many countries around the world. Um, and that's been a, a story I've been trying to tell people for, for many years now. Thank you. Anthony, Anthony, thank you. Yeah, go on, go on. As a physician, and I'm, you know, we all know who Anthony is because we've been following the NHFD for a long time. And it's one of the things we're very proud of. Um, the question really is, if you look at those blue bars in the bar chart that was shown about how practice has changed and how non-operative management um, has been taking place because of the COVID. How do you dissect the granular detail? Because I suspect you'll find those blue bars are restricted to a small group. It's a process issue. And you'll probably find it's restricted to a small group of hospitals which, uh, in which the management of these injuries is perhaps not optimum. And if you link those with the previous performance of those trusts on the NHFD, I suspect you might find a positive correlation. Yes, so because, because we can see what's happening in every hospital in the country, I am going to have to write to those hospitals this week and say, why are you not operating on a quarter of your patients? Because for the quarter of people who don't have surgery, their mortality goes up to 25%. Absolutely. Um, just because they've been neglected. Uh, but that, that, you know, I can, I can get very excited about that, but non-operative management is normal in other countries. Um, so what, what we can learn from other countries' approach to non-operative management is very different. There's still a need to, to learn about how you manage patients uh, with an extended family, uh, where hospital care is only a very short element of, of patients' care, where rehabilitation happens outside hospitals. So there's still so much to learn from other countries as well. But yes, those, those are emails I am sending this week. Yeah. I if hope I may you come in on that one as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on, Andrew. If I may come in on that. So, um, our impact services survey, um, which I'll put into the chat there now, there's a URL link, um, has specific questions on how um, each hospital has uh, either changed or not changed their process by which they manage hip fracture patients, specifically pertaining to, for instance, uh, surgical versus non-surgical uh, and the justification for that. So um, it will be a fascinating 
um, way to just really get a picture of what other people are doing, you know, what's in the other guy's toolbox. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, now, Rajesh, you want to comment something from India for us? Yeah, so uh, I think I would like to respond to some of the points raised by Dr. Nanu. Uh, one thing is that, uh, you know, I personally think and we have to get more data before it's uh, really uh, uh, sort of uh, proven. But I think that uh, it's not just the genetic uh, makeup. Uh, when the breakout occurred in Iran, I think that was a testing time. I was hoping that the Indians in Iran would possibly not get uh, Corona if they are somewhat resistant, but then uh, there was a large number of Indians who were affected. So I think it is something of a genetic thing with some environmental factors built in. Because if we talk about living in India with the whole kind of immunity, we face so many viruses all through the year. We have every year we have a dengue outbreak. You know, we, we have, uh, and then we have a public health system which has to deal with malaria and, you know, uh, and uh, dengue and chikungunya and uh, Japanese encephalitis and all. So I think that is one difference. The second difference, you know, the whole lot of theories about the BCG, you know, now we are, uh, uh, because we are all immunized with the BCG, uh, the fact about, uh, the fact that uh, we have much younger population, so maybe it's because the countries which have uh, older population are not doing so uh, well. And, you know, we have had mortality among healthcare workers. We have had mortality among the anesthetists. Um, but I agree that when it's a pandemic, the chances of contracting the infection out of the hospital is higher. Because in the hospital, I mean, we have been very lucky. We have been running an ICU uh, and we have been looking after the maximum number of sick patients with COVID is in my ICU in Delhi. So half the patients on ventilator, more than half actually, in the entire city of Delhi are in my, uh, my COVID facility in the ICU. And touch wood, till date, in the last seven weeks, we haven't had a single healthcare professional get infection because they were working in an ICU full of uh, 24 patients. So I think in a hospital, you are well protected in the PPE. And you have educated, if you have educated everybody well, they know how to don they know how to talk, they are not going to contaminate themselves. And remember, we are talking about not just the doctors, but nurses, the technicians, the, uh, the, uh, the sweeper, the, the uh, sanitary attendant who uh, is sometimes totally uneducated. And for him to don uh, a PPE and go and clean up uh, the ICU and come out and doff properly, we have ensured that there's an infection control now nurse all the time in the uh, in the dawning area, in the doffing area. Uh, and uh, we have actually staggered their uh, duty hours so that the dawning in the doffing areas don't get crowded. So like I said in my last talk, uh, we have evolved a lot, learned a lot. But I think this is something which is uh, definitely uh, distinct from what you have been seeing in UK or you have been seeing in the Europe. We uh, do have, you know, I mean, the 69%, like I said, according to ICMR, asymptomatic. I don't really know what's the incidence of asymptomatic infections in the other country, but that would suddenly drastically bring down the death rate because, you know, if, if you have not tested a huge number of patients, the number of people who are dying remain the same as numerator, but denominator is much bigger than what you are thinking because if you take all those who have been infected as the denominator, then what you are counting as positive on the test is a small proportion. So I think it's it's uh, it's possibly for next couple of years we'll keep on finding out the facts about why things happened the way they are happening today. And uh, but then I like I said, only time will tell. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you, Rajesh. Thank you, thank you for uh, covering our uh, uh, from the Indian perspective. Ajivala, you have something to say on that? Yes, well, even in Nigeria, we have found that the response to the COVID virus has varied amongst people 
we have had, I've had a few senior colleagues who had community acquired infections who remained asymptomatic even though they were about 60. And then we've had a few people who were much younger who didn't fare so well. So of course it's been noted that um, the presence of comorbidities is a major problem. But one of the things that I think comes into play in at least in Nigeria is the BCG vaccination, which is routine at birth, the vaccination for bacillus calmedgari for protection against tuberculosis. Some studies have found that that actually protects against respiratory infections and some other infections other than TB. And the incidences that we've seen and the death rates that we've seen have slightly varied based on cultural perspectives and optics of the vaccine. So maybe that is something that we should look at in addition to looking at genetics. So it might not be entirely genetics alone, but it might also have to do with vaccinate, other vaccinations that have been received in childhood that have altered the immune system over a long period of time. And that may actually affect the manifestation and the severity of the, of the disease. That's the, at least that's the perspective that I have to add to the other things that have, that have been said. I think that's a uh, thank you. Sorry, I think that's a very valid point. The trouble is, most of the people who died here from the BAME group, that's black and minor, black Asian minority ethnic, have all had BCG because they are first generation immigrants, and they okay. come from countries where universal BCG uh, BCG vaccination or children. In fact, children born of first generation immigrants here from the BAME community also get BCG vaccination. Um, locally, because it is understood that they will be visiting the country of their parents, and therefore they'll be at increased risk. So I'm not sure that that is, uh, you know, something that we can say. So the genetics is the same of Indians living in India and Indians living here. The vaccination status is the same, but the antigenic stimulus, the ongoing antigenic stimulus that Rajesh was talking about in terms of chicken ganya, et cetera, et cetera, is completely different. And maybe that's the answer, but it's fascinating. And I think we need physicians and we need people like Andrew to look into this detail globally and come up with the answers because as somebody said, this isn't going away. It'll come back next year to say hello. I completely agree with that. It's one thing to have the vaccine. It's another thing to have ongoing antigenic stimulation that modifies how the body responds to whatever I come across with. So I completely agree with that. So, uh, um, Amar, if I may make one more point. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I have been uh, running the busiest uh, ICU uh, as uh, administrative in charge of trauma center, and I have seen the death. Uh, I can tell you, we have an alarming number of people with malignancies who are getting COVID and who are dying. So, I think the uh, malignancy is a very, very bad prognostic sign. We have negative even after so many days. So I whether it's a local milieu with a nasopharyngeal carcinoma that you know the the virus is just sort of sitting there and not moving. We have had an alarming number of strokes. Now you know we are all still thinking that you know whether somebody who comes with myocardial infarction during COVID. Who, or who comes with a, a stroke during COVID is basically a coincidental finding or it's actually a causative thing. Now, the, we saw it long back. One of our first patients died, came to ICU with a stroke and was positive for uh, Corona. And I think about a couple of weeks later, the report started coming in that uh, the uh, Corona could you know, be associated with the strokes. Having said that, the fact that many of the people who are terminally ill are coming with COVID positive because they are more prone to get COVID infection, a time will come where it will be difficult to tell whether a person died because of corona or he died with corona. Yeah, I think I think definitely the, the research and the time will tell as you guys are, are sort of uh, putting the word. I mean, definitely, I, I do have uh, 
to agree on those points and I don't think there is any controversial in that sense. Now, a couple of questions which have come in. I think uh, Srikant on the chat has asked for, uh, my chat has suddenly disappeared, I don't know why. I have only three questions now here. Uh, Dr. Nanu, uh, is, there, is this because the increased morbidity or increased number of people who are working in public services in the UK from the BME group? That's a, it's a valid point. And I think 44%, this is off the top of my head. I'm sure our physician colleague here uh, will, Anthony will correct me, but I think 44% of people working in the health service are of black, Asian and minority ethnic, but in the medics, 94% of the dead are from this group. So the stats don't add up. Um, yes, there are more. And there are several theories. I was taking part in a webinar for the Royal College of Surgeons. I'm a council member there a few days ago on why the BAME group, the black, Asian minority ethnic, are so disproportionately effective. And there are several th theories that came out. We don't know the answers. These are the theories. One of the theories is that black, Asian, and minority ethnic people in the United Kingdom feel that they, they are not quite as assertive in their requirements or their requests. I may be wrong here, but this is what came out of the... Um, the webinar when we were asking people, because a lot of people who are black, Asian or minority ethnic are not consultants. They tend to be at the middle grade, which is the staff and associate specialist grade. And a lot of them don't feel that they can go against middle management, which tells them purely from a pragmatic point of view, because there was initially a shortage of PPE to go ahead and talk to people. And if you look at Public Health England guidance initially, it was that you did not need even a surgical mask or gown to talk to people. You only needed it for aerosol generating procedures and PHE changed its stance after a couple of weeks. But I think a lot of damage was done in that time. And I understand why PHE would have um, given that guidance because initially we didn't have a large stockpile of um, adequate masks. So while white people felt um, able and they had the communication skills and the ability to ask in a way uh, without being offensive for the equipment and refusing to work again in a perfectly polite and um, you know um, non litigious way uh, to refuse to work in the front line unless somebody provided them with this. The black Asian and minority ethnic did not feel empowered enough to do that. That's one of the questions. Second is there is a theory that people like me, so I'm of Indian origin, I'm first generation, I'm 62, I'm at high risk. I'm on the front line because my main interest is trauma. So we are now being given the option um, by a letter coming through to put ourselves through a risk um, assessment ourselves and then ask to be taken off the front line. But a lot of people like me feel that we came into medicine to do a particular job. And unless we are, you know, as Rajesh has said, suffering from cancer or something that affects our immune status, the very fact that we may be fat, I'm not particularly fat by the way, um, or we are morbidly obese, etc., then there is, we feel that having been through the good times, we should not be stepping back and asking other people to take the risk on our behalf. And there is a, an element of bravado in the black, Asian, and minority ethnic that prevents them from stepping back from the front line. Again, as I said, these are theories and time will tell whether they're true. So this question about the BCG, et cetera, has been raised, the genetics has been raised, but why aren't we seeing the deaths in, in, in Delhi and Mumbai? You know, we would expect the numbers. We're not talking about the mortality ratio because we don't know what population has been through the 80% asymptomatic, et cetera. We don't know it here, and we know it even less in India. And antibody testing of the population will give us that answer when it comes through. But I'd be very interested to see what the Ain Shams, I've been to Ain Shams, and if you think the All India Institute is a big place, try going to Ain Shams. I'd love to hear what the Egyptian experience of this is amongst the healthcare workers. Dr. Mazia, would you want to answer that? Uh... Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Mazia? Sorry? Yes, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Dr. Anand was yes. mentioning you. Did you hear the question? Yes, I have to comment. Yeah, please. please. Yeah, please. Yes. The, the statistical and the information coming from different countries all over the world are variable. And different according to the assembly of the population, you are getting the information out of them. Information from the uh, health caring uh, provider and the doctor, nurses, people in the hospital dealing with the problem differ from the culture and the population outside the hospital. People in the hospital have to be also, they are in the reception, in emergency room, or in the ICU, 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 ICU and dealing with continuous meticulous exhausting work with the patients themselves. So we have now many casualty. We have 13 doctors just have lost their life, and we have about 20 uh, five or something like this from the nursing and of course from the population around the hospital we have some but is the curve uh, up is the grade of the curve in Egypt is the same like USA and India there is difference in the curve the severity of the uh, infection and there is some size at the same time the character of the genetic background, the vaccination in the past history for tuberculosis, and at the same time, the average age, because our age in Egypt are younger group as compared with European and uh, American and uh, Western country, where the elder are group with comorbidities are suffering and they have the complication and finally they die. Because our uh, population are not so elder, at the same time, we are herd uh, contamination and herd immunity, developing herd immunity, exposure to similar influenza, like the big influenza, birds influenza, and this, and there is similarity. So the statistics come from every country is just uh, you are expressing what you are finding in the ground at prison. But we didn't have the follow up to see if this our suggestion and our theory in the explaining the spread of the disease is correct or not, we have to make a still longer follow-up. Personal protection uh, facilities is the key of success of any program. Personal uh, protection for every person, distant, distancing outside, taking care, putting the mask and the keep cleaning. At the same time, the personal protection inside the hospital. Of course, in the theater, we have to be ultimate ultra care because we are doing direct contamination with the patient fluid and our machines, the drill, the power. So we can shift uh, in the innovation. We have to shift ourselves as the corona going to stay with us longer time till the vaccination comes for the whole world and it has to be successful vaccination. So the care has to be very uh, specified and we care about uh, ourselves and shift our technique to the less intervention be more conservative. Elective surgery have to be planned in different way. Go to the minimal invasive side and use the image and the close the reduction and the binning, close the binning for orthopedic fracture as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I think, in fact, a couple of things which we are looking at. Uh, in the uh, last few weeks, I think uh, we heard, and we definitely have uh, Rajesh here. Uh, you can, and uh, all the faculty can give us uh, the question, I mean, the answers for this. In regard to the elective surgeries, I mean, I know we did mention in a couple of slides, and then we are discussing on that. How soon can we look at, to, I mean, to start? One, because AIMS has already applied and taking the permission to the government. Uh, what, what stage you're in there, Rajesh, for that? And then we'll get the other faculties to look at in the elective. Uh, are we going to wait till the vaccine to start the elective surgery? It's going to be too late. And But one thing I want to understand and one thing, once what I learned being in UK for nearly two decades, now people come on to the waiting list. Let us talk about an injury on the knee or the shoulder. Uh, arthroscopy or ACL reconstruction doesn't happen, you know, as an emergency. It takes a long time, at least six months to one year or even uh, two years or three years of waiting list. Now the waiting list time has changed, I agree, but they are non-emergency uh, operations. But in India, what is happening is the other way around. Somebody has an uh, ACL rupture, it is 
within uh, five days, within a week, it has to be fixed, it has to be done. And I have seen the results, I've seen the uh, papers back and forth. I would like you to look at two questions now. How soon can we start the elective surgeries? Keeping the background of, it is not essential, or I would not say uh, non-emergency. How, how far can we delay that? Rajesh? Me. Rajesh, can I answer yeah. that? We put the, we wait the complaint of the patient. Is it real emergency? I mean, if it is as a spine surgeon, if it is uh, hematoma on the spinal cord, cord compression, he is paralyzed. Uh, paralysis is increasing if I delay this operation or no. If the situation is uh, quiescent and you know, added the uh, compression factor to come as emergency. So it is emergency for him. It is pain and uh, paraplegia, and this is the two main causes for spinal decompression. I do spinal compression for this patient, not because of the pain, because of the dangerousness which he is suffering, because compression, he may deteriorate. This I task myself and risk him, even if he corona 19, and we go together with, to the theater with the full precaution. But if it is just degenerative spine with the pain, low back pain, and some sciatic pain, of course, this is not emergency. And we have to, to, to teach our patient and teach ourselves to make this in the back uh, seated arrangement. So we have to select if it is if it's a patient with a fractured spine. Whatever it is, compression fracture with osteoporosis or just a traumatic fracture. This has emergency and you are ready and you are staying to do this. But as we make blockage for the movement and the people are indoors, the number of emergency in orthopedic and the spine became less. So the brunt on the doctor in the, in the hospital became less. And we as surgeon, orthopedic especially, and the trauma surgeon and the spine surgeon have to uh, save the resources of the hospital for our doctor and our nurses to take care with the other patient with corona who came for uh, hospital bed, IC, ICU bed in the same time. So we can save this elective surgery from our side. So, uh, Amar, you want me to... Uh... You want me to say something? Mm. So uh, I think uh, I, it has been said, and I'll just summarize. There are various criteria for opening up the routine work. The first one is that you know uh, you should ideally be doing it when the graph starts going down. It shows a downward trend when you see that less and less of new cases are being reported. We in India are on the up now, and this is not the time to start the routine work. Now, because you don't know when your facilities will get completely overwhelmed by a large number of patients coming. So till that time you stop getting fresh cases and you start going down, it's not really practical or ethical to start the routine work. Now, when you do a routine work, suppose you want to start an outpatient. What we have been arguing is there's no point in starting outpatients in orthopedics if you don't have the theaters, right? So if you can't operate on them, there's no point in running an outpatient. That's number two. Number three, we have been doing the emergency and semi-emergency surgeries all through. In fact, my tumor surgeon colleague did about 50 cases in the first uh, 30 days after the lockdown. And uh, I have told him to write it up and publish since he has done on the outcome. But we have to remember, we have, we have continued to do the hip fractures. But if you look at what Dr. Hall showed, it's not just about brevedo. If you are operating on a patient who's positive, the chances of his getting complications is much higher, right? Yes. So that's, you're not doing a good to a patient who's not going to die because of his illness by subjecting him to a surgery, which might kill him. The next thing for people like us, you know, if 
there is we have actually committed we first gave 25% of the resident strength to the common pool for the hospital for covid then we made it 50% and now they have asked for 25% of the faculty strength we at this point of time have 65 sick patients in trauma center we have about 500 patients who are recovering from corona in another satellite center and all of them need the med, the uh, staff to look after them all of need, them need ppes so the center which has got no sick patients with nearly 500 patients are using up 250 ppes every day so remember it's not about one person or one unit being able to do these surgeries you have to keep in mind you have to keep the pandemic you have to keep your eyes on the pandemic all the time because you may be asked you know to go and work in a critical care even an orthopedic surgeon because they are not enough people because they are quarantined or they are sick you know so the opening up of these surgeries is dependent on so many things the other thing which i briefly mentioned was there's an apprehension in everybody's mind that every patient should be tested but we know that the patient might come to you at a phase which is before after infection and before he tests positive and then you admit him and he becomes positive so somebody said in china or some center they are admitting patient for two weeks and if the patient doesn't develop an illness at the end of 10 days go ahead and operate but I think a more practical solution will be a more widespread testing. And like I said, the best patient to operate for, a, for an elective surgery is one who has had the infection and he's become non-infective now. He needs, so if I have to start, I'll start in patients like this. I'll start with daycare surgeries, ACL, you know, things like anything where I can send the patient home in the evening, right? And then that will also need the healthcare workers to be tested frequently. You don't want to become amplifiers of pandemic in your hospital. You don't want patients to come, get infected, and then go back. And that happens in a pandemic with a whole lot of patients will come who are infected but are not yet showing up. So unless you have widespread testing facility, unless the epidemic is on its way out, unless you can spare enough manpower to look after the COVID and non-COVID requirements, Unless you have a motivated, still competent, uh, the, uh, the health healthcare worker force who have not been quarantined and not become sick, it's really not practical to start doing the, the routine work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank Vivek, you. You, you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, if I could just uh, add. Can I just okay. add? Yeah, 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 but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what Rajesh is saying, we've, again, when he was with us last time, we had the same thing. The essence is really the timing and the timing is based on the instantaneous re uh, reproduction number. And that's what he was talking about, the curve changing. But also it's involved with other three keys and that's the availability of the testing, significant testing, with the availability of PP, PPE, and then the availability of core services that can make the functioning of the hospital or the locality function properly. And if you don't have that, then um, your elective surgery is not going to start. And then people would like to start with those ones who are already infected in cases like endoscopies and simple day cases, which has been mooted secretly behind our backs. And we've got a little bit of an ear to it. And maybe Anthony, who's on screen now, has heard about it as well. So there's a little bit of a rumor, rumor mill going on um, you know, from our head office that those are the cases we'd start with. But you don't want to take on patients and then develop a pandemic within your own hospital or have a surge of the pandemic within your own hospital. So those are the key. It's the timing, the testing, the PPE and the availability of the core services. Uh, so I would say, Amarnath, um, we, we should not kind of say one size fits all. Uh, to make a point, I can share my screen uh, with you guys. Uh, I don't think I can. I, that sharing has to be turned on. Yeah, you can. Uh, there's a. There's a. Uh, I did. I did. Press that. I pressed that. There you go. Uh, nope, it's not letting me. Sorry. Okay, talk, talk us through. Yeah. So what I was trying to say is, 
um, for example, I'll give the update from US. So like uh, Dr. Malhotra said, we, we operated through, all, through the trauma. Uh, we didn't stop, obviously we can't. And then um, uh, we were watching. So White House came up with this uh, three phase opening and we are in phase two of the opening. And then uh, also every state has its own way of dealing with that. So our governor has divided into seven phases. So we were allowed, this has been all scientifically done. We were allowed to start our electives last week. So for two weeks, we are uh, operating half the capacity of, uh, I usually operate six joints in a day, two rooms. So I was given one room and then um, three cases. So in two weeks, I'll be, I'll be having an opportunity to do full. The reason is I wish I could uh, show you this picture which shows the United States um, map, uh, New York, where uh, the um, mortality is very high and uh, 34,000 infected, 22,000 dead. My state has 1,641 cases, uh, about uh, 62 deaths. So we can't say, hey, we, obviously you can't do this all over the country. There are hospitals I know uh, in this state, some states have closed because uh, they have a capability to do stuff and there are no COVID cases. So what are they supposed to do? How are the hospitals supposed to survive? So my suggestion is individualize it. So if, you, if, if your state has or your region has low COVID cases and then you have enough PPE, start. So that's what we are doing. We are, we are starting the elective cases. So in the, uh, trying to stop this, some of these uh, joints are so bad, they trip, fall, and then become a uh, emergency anyway. So, uh, and then uh, we may have a second surge, all the states are opening up. There's a difference of mentality between Western nation and for example, you, uh, India. Here they are, they can take, it's a human mentality, they can take um, restriction only so much. Uh, the uh, liberty, there's uh, independent, I mean, individual liberty is given after th four weeks, six weeks, they will stop and they'll just go out. So we may have a second surge, unfortunately. Then we'll cut back to where we were before. So otherwise you can't keep the whole economy shut uh, trying to deal with this. Yeah, true. A couple of questions coming from the chat there. I mean, Srikant has said, is it true now that in the UK, if a HCP fails fit test, then FFP3 marks he should. I mean, he can't work in the hospital in the acute setting. And any comments uh, from the UK group, Anand, Anthony, and uh, Andrew? Well, I can take that because we've been through this. Okay. So we have four different kinds of FFP3 masks. Um, if you fail all of them and you're basically machine tested. So there's a little thing that connects up to a laptop. You get a little thing hole punched with a, with a tiny little um, um, catheter coming out. And you can tell you know, what, whether you're 100% effective or not on each mask. If you fail them all, then you get an individual respirator. And that's a terrible thing. It's, it's like one of these astronauts things and you have a belt around your waist and that is, um, it, the battery is supposed to work for between six to eight hours. And the problem is if you're halfway through a procedure and you haven't, you've forgotten to recharge it, then you do have a significant problem. So the answer is no. If you fail a fit test on the three or four different masks that are available, you will get a respirator if it's important for you to be in the front line. So that, that, that's not true, that you can't work in the front line. You're just given a, a different kind of protection. Is there any difference uh, in uh, the Nigeria or uh, USA and Vivek? Uh, here is the thing. Um, they are varying the rules depending on availability, which was unfortunate. Initially, we were short of N95 masks, believe it or not. The UK thinks, seems to be doing better in that way. And we have an access to N95 masks, and then uh, there are only three sizes to fit in. So all the faces are not going to fit in, but you have to choose one or the other. So, uh, the, and there is no individualized respirator available yet. So 
we are even though we think that we are wearing n95 mask we are not safe and then you don't get n95 mask every other day to change so it gets damaged so uh, we get three sets and then you're supposed to give it to the or and they will sterilize it uv sterilizers give it to you back in three hours so that's the best we can do at this time that's unfortunate and we think that we are protected i will tell you we are not the unless you do the fit test every single day you get a fresh n95 mask every single day i think it's impossible to be 100% sure i think uh, rajesh was telling us when uh, he came in earlier on in the uh, session a couple of months ago and we also have had uh, the i think aims doing those tests as well as uh, keeping the mask in the sun for so many hours and rajesh any comment on that uh, please so uh, we have been uh, um, <clears throat> we have a protocol for reuse of uh, n95 mask and uh, because it's now in the community and uh, it's widespread so there are two kinds of thing one is every healthcare worker has been given an n95 mask for his use not one but what you do is you give them the uh, the four masks at a time and four paper bags so every day when you use the mask when you go home you put it in a paper bag and you can put it in sun and just leave it away the second day you use a second mask the third day you use a third mask and then you uh, we have been to be on the safer side have been using them four times each so every 20 days we are issuing an n95 mask to every healthcare worker that's for their uh, routine use everywhere else not necessarily in the covid area now in a covid area the mask has to be uh, taken off and it's not to be reused but we have actually a protocol in place and uh, we have tested it and uh, we have run it to 30 cycles and the protocol is much the same as that described by the duke university it's a room of a certain dimension and we have a vaporizer which uh, vaporizes hydrogen peroxide and uh, it's actually what we have is the duke says only uh, say 25 minutes cycle and 20 minutes aeration uh, the dwell time gas dwell time and then you open and let the fresh air in we on the safer side have been using it for 3 hours so our exposure time is 3 hours but the important thing is that you know you cannot use any of these ppe with uh, uh, disinfection if they are visibly oiled if they've got blood on them if they have got body fluids on them so you remember that there is there is a limit to which you can actually put them through a reuse but then the uh, our uh, our um, uh, our microbiologists have uh, proven that it's possible to decontaminate and identify effectively and uh, the uh, duke duke university showed that they can do it 50 times but recommended only for 30 but i think uh, we have done that many cycles to show that it remains protective and it is uh, good and we have a question here dr surya kant bharti is asking uh, please guide us about the surgeries in the remote i mean uh, whether you're in remote area or like a green zone or orange zone or red zone kind of thing what's been done in the country uh, i think uh, you people have answered that fairly enough but any uh, comment on that please guide us through about the surgeries in the remote areas for so covid positive patient the 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 green areas are the best areas to start because the uh, the uh, 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 if you saw what i said about the risk factors if uh, you have a hot spot then every person coming from that hot spot is like no i was uh, on a on a television program recently and the anchor said that you know these people didn't have a travel history so i said why are you talking about travel history so much down the line now i mean all those who have traveled unless you bring them back now all those who are already in the community they have done whatever they had to do now you will not have anybody who has recently traveled because the travel has been shut for last uh, couple of months but now instead it is replaced by instead of saying that uh, have you traveled from a corona country a corona area now you have to say are you living in a red area or a red zone or a hot spot so if you are from a hot spot then there is a high risk that you may uh, be uh, infected or uh, 
pre infection or an asymptomatic infected person so all that travel history thing is now equivalent to a travel from the red area and i think in our setup in india it's not a wise thing to start anything routine in the red areas because those are the areas where a large numbers are being reported daily and i think we should concentrate more on containment and life saving there rather than thinking about the life surgery and the, the uh, they're thinking about the routine surgery the green areas though a different ball game so if you are in a green area and you have sufficient manpower and the ppes i don't think anybody is going to stop you because the government wants the routine work to start basically because nobody knows till what time this is going to last and nobody wants to keep losing patient who are non covid but then the constraints are like i said the manpower the ppes the uh, you know the you have do you have enough uh, sort of uh, uh, the where with all to do it that is what makes the difference and second thing is that you know i would say that it is a little uh, risky to operate on a patient who might later on turn out to be corona positive because here we are talking about a compromised outcome so if i'm operating on a head injury right he is covid positive we are doing cesarean sections in my hospital because it's uh, it's got a theater for covid positive patients we have done a few uh, cesarean sections and delivered <coughs> babies those are unavoidable you can't avoid that but you can avoid a routine surgery but then if you are taking that risk for a patient who will otherwise die if you did not intervene or significantly compromise in terms of outcome you can take that risk but i would be quite wary of taking that type of risk for a knee replacement or a hip replacement with which the, for a condition with which the patient has been living for a long time right bharat you wanted to ask something uh, he is there bharat is there yeah i am here sir yeah bharat um, is a spine surgeon from amdavad for the uh, faculty bharat Kaur. yeah sir 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 good evening sir mainly to the uk uk doctors you know uh, I means uh, what sort of extreme precautions we should take before we take the semi emergency cases because if you don't operate they go into from bad to worse and you operate then also you know we know that the risk are significantly high so what sort of maximum precaution should we be uh, i mean should we use the high um, uh, the tools you know the, the the tools that generate the arousal Evert, Nano, uh, Andrew, to the British, British. Yeah, I'll say to Andrew. So, I, what I would say is that when we talk about high risk and low risk, we need to be very careful that we're not talking about relative risk. We're talking about absolute risk, and it's very easy for you to get, uh, as for an orthopedic surgeon, to get very worried about the high risk of wound infection in their patient when. the risk of wound infection goes from 1% to 2% um which is a very small number uh the it's a doubling of relative risk but the absolute risk it may still be small and i think until we've measured risk in an intelligent way we can't really make intelligent decisions about whether people should carry on having uh procedure so people waiting for cardiac surgery who may have a 5% chance of dying this year um if they don't have cardiac surgery the decision as to whether coronavirus increases that requires data that we don't yet have and we need to be collecting the data uh, rather than getting excited about our own particular area of expertise uh great uh, anybody else in the uh, ever you want to comment something on that no, i think that's that's spot on i mean you don't you, you don't know the absolute risk i mean uh, I noticed we have had not from Nigeria any just as a throwaway we have not had any comment about Africa and HIV and immunocompromised because you know Ananda brought up the genetics and the potential of the antigen boost but nobody's commented about HIV which you know 25 to 30% of people are HIV pro- uh, positive in the southern african area you can know, i just why, add- there, why are there only 600 deaths in south africa Yeah can I just add something here. Yeah. So first thing is rather than going to the details there are two documents that I think I'll post a link to your WhatsApp group and you can circulate it. One is from the Royal College of Surgeons of England telling you about how 
and when a recovery of your elective services should occur and what the basic prerequisites are. These are broad principles and you can then, um, you know, sort of adapt it to your personal circumstances. Similarly, the BOA has also, um, it had a webinar three days ago and I think yesterday it's published some guidelines on recovery of elective services. But what we do locally is we have started, so all the private hospitals in the United Kingdom have had all their services bought out by the National Health Service until the 28th of June. That's when the current contract ends. And there's talk about extending that. So we have green sites where these uh, private hospitals, where we were doing hip and knee replacements and some cardiac procedures. And the, the theory is that we've started doing all the day case elective stuff this week gone. And not next week, but the week after, we'll be starting urgent uh, major surgery in those centers. So what are the prerequisites? The prerequisites are you want to know that the patients do not, are not currently carrying the, the virus, i.e. antigen positive, um, and that the staff are also not carrying it because we do know that there's up to an 80% asymptomatic uh, or mildly symptomatic rate. So Public Health England have approved a, um, an antibody test from Roche, um, which is a Swiss firm, and that is supposed to be 100% specific and sensitive. And that is going to be rolled out and all NHS staff will be tested priority-wise so you can return to work. If you've got high antibody teachers, then you are relatively safe to carry on and work. That's the theory anyway. So you're, you know that your RT-PCR is between 10 to 30% uh, false negative. So what we are doing currently locally is the patient self-isolates for two weeks prior to semi-urgent surgery. Say somebody with avascular necrosis of both hips who can't walk. So the health and social care budget is one. So if, you, if somebody can't walk at home because they're old, somebody's going to have to go in and look after them three times a day and feed them. That is also a call on the same resource. So it's all a question of balancing risks. So what we are doing here, um, starting the week gone, is the patient has to self-isolate. You ring the patient, you see if their condition has changed, if they still want surgery. You discuss with them the risks in the current coronavirus climate of the increased risks to them. Then they have to self-isolate for a period of two weeks. Seven days before surgery, they have an RT-PCR done. If the test is positive, then they are put back on the list and they're not done until they are retested once they've been over it. If the test is negative, then they are retested 48 hours before surgery. They are brought in, they have their surgery, and then they go back out home as quickly as they can. So that's the current um, algorithm that we are following um, because COVID isn't going to go away. And a lot of people are now dying of non-COVID related problems that we are not seeing because we're all concentrating on the Rottweiler chewing on our backside. And we are forgetting the little chihuahuas that are nibbling at our toes. And that's part of the problem. You're not gonna die from that. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I agree with that. Uh, I think Hope Bharat, you got your answer there. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Maziad actually, I think, was there who commented uh, quite a, I mean, earlier on on the same uh, thing. Now, one question which, which is lingering on our mind, I mean, obviously, uh, what is the best test that can be done for uh, patients getting in uh, for admissions? And is it is it only the RT-PCR that need to be done, or are we going to be doing a rapid test and then confirming it, like an antigen or antibody test? And there are a lot of uh, false negatives coming in as well. And with the test kit coming in, I know there's a huge issue in the country. Uh, Rajesh and others can start to and then share what, what and how it's been done. So um, the um, antibody test is not for us. It is for uh, the epidemiologist. But it has a limited value. I'll still say not rule it out completely. Because if your purpose is to find out whether a person is infective or not. If your antibody test comes as negative, you still don't know whether that person is infected or not because he could still be infected and he could be transmitting the disease to you. 
So if it is negative, you still have to do an RT-PCR, right? If it is positive, then, you know, it still does not tell you whether, you know, you are really, uh, it, it shows you have had infection, right? So if, unless it is IgG and you can't find IgM, which means that the infection was a long time back, then it becomes a tool and that's where a little window of opportunity for us is there that we can say okay this person has had infection now and is immune and i can check him up but if it is uh, uh, you know just uh, negative it doesn't help unlike an rt pcr if an rt pcr is negative it means the patient doesn't have infection it still means that he could still be in the early two or three days of infection when he still not become positive so the problem about this whole disease is that it is a great uh, sort of deceiver and uh, the other things like SARS and MERS which we had we had an advantage that you became infective a couple of days after you became symptomatic so you could catch a person who's symptomatic put him uh, in a room isolate him and you are safe here you are with somebody who comes to you and he has already spread it to you don't know how many people before even any test become positive. And the issue about antibody is that, you know, if antibody is not sensitive and uh, it's not accurate, like these test kits which we had, I'm glad you don't have a Chinese consultant on the board, then that becomes an absolutely useless thing to do. Any other comments from others? Uh, so, um, the, according to me, the best way to do, and it may not be uh, possible, is uh, do the testing two times because that will decrease the incidence of uh, false uh, um, negatives. So, at our hospital at this time, we are doing a rapid test for surgeries or emergency. They are we are able to take the patient once they get admitted on the same day or within 24 hours, the hospital doesn't let us do rapid test if the clearance for the patient, medical clearance is not received. So then we do the 72 hours test, which is a pain in the neck to do. So even with these two things, we may still, there may be, a, I, I call this virus a stealth virus. And I think it is, it is a, I don't think it's a natural virus without saying too many things. This is a designer virus. Um, a natural virus, uh, according to me, does not behave like that. And this is made in such a way that the uh, emphasis is kept on spreading uh, stealthily. So now we have to find ways to attack this stealthily. So make multiple um, areas of restriction where we can catch it. It'll still escape us. So the best situation for now is Patient gets a rapid test. Um, I don't think four days of quarantine is going to be sufficient, at least a week of quarantine. And if it doesn't develop symptoms, even their patients may not quarantine themselves. And we cannot get all of these people in the hospital. So there's another loophole there. And then take the patient to the OR. If this is the case, and people have been asking, how do we not use the aerosolized uh, equipment? I can't do a total knee without my saw, obviously. There's no other way to use it. We have to use it. So uh, with these multiple restrictions, I think we can safely use these equipments. And that's the only way to do this. Yeah, coming to those, I think, uh, any comment from Mazia and uh, Ajibola? Yes, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers because I got knowledge from each one of them. But uh, still we have to restrict uh, the indication of surgery during the epidemic to the top urgent uh, emergency to get better chance. And of course, if the patient is compromised and we operate on him, he may be changed from coronavirus negative to positive. And the point of interest is that uh, raised up by our doctor professor from England, that the infection rate and the skin closure will be a major problem and we will find our patient with corona or catch corona had delayed wound healing 
and it changed by time to septicemic shock because you cannot control the infection if it is deeply seated infection. So we have to wait. What is the benefit of doing the surgery, even if it is indicated? It is highly indicated for this particular patient. It is a fracture nick of femur, fracture crocanter, fracture shock, or fracture clavicle. Of course, you are an orthopedic surgeon who was doing fixation for the clavicular fracture and doing fixation for coolis fracture. This has to be stopped in the corona time. At the same time, if it is an emergency, we have to have the whole proportion to have safe outcome. And we consider that corona cases is not normal individual. He, by, by catching the corona, you're going to be with more morbidity than he is morbidity with his age or his, 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 his morbidity, even if he will see a healthy one, it can be changed to worse one. So caution and caution and caution. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, about the comments with other immune um, conditions that cause immune compromise and the interaction with corona. Now, for HIV, the national values, uh, the reported values are between 1.8 and 3.8, roughly about 2 to 4 percent over the past few years. And so far, we've had 30,657 confirmed cases in Nigeria to date. So it's probably a bit early for us to be able to identify enough patients who have coexisting corona and HIV for us to be able to determine the specifics of the interaction of coronavirus with HIV. But what we do know is that any condition that causes immune compromise, now conditions like diabetes mellitus and um, symptomatic uh, hypertensive heart disease and malignancies, morbid obesity, all of those that are common in much higher, that are present in much higher numbers in the population significantly affect the manifestation and the severity of the, of the disease. That we know. With time, like it has been said, the coronavirus is probably not going to go away for any time soon. So over time, we probably will be able to determine how it interacts with HIV. But for now, generally, we just have it. We just have the knowledge that the presence of other comorbidities makes the manifestation more severe. What we have been looking at in terms of resuming elective cases essentially is we're focusing on, we've been focusing on employing the use of telemedicine and, and assessing patients via, a lot of apps have been coming up in the past, just yesterday I was discussing with a colleague who was working on an app that allows us to interact with patients over, the, over a video call. And then we can now schedule meetings for patients that we have to see in person who we need to examine or patients who have had surgery who need to have the stitches taken out for where stitches have to be taken out. But we tend to use more of absorbable subcortical stitches so patients don't have to come back for, to have their stitches removed. So essentially what we're looking at is reducing the contact between the patients and the physician while we are gradually resuming um, our elective cases. But in all sincerity, this part of the world is about a couple of weeks to a month in manifestation behind Europe and Asia and parts of America. So in those parts of the world, numbers, numbers are still on the rise and are just beginning to play too. So we probably will be resuming we probably will be resuming elective cases a bit later than the rest of the world because numbers here are still on the increase. Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. I'd like to bring up, oh, okay, what, you said something? No, very helpful. Uh, yeah. in, South Africa, yeah. 40, in South Africa, 40 to 60, percent of people with HIV have not attended outpatient clinics in the last for the last week. Oh, that's a big number. 
I'm, I'm going to bring in Dr. Jha, who is a senior orthopedic surgeon from uh, Patna. Dr. Jha. Well, thank you, Dr. Amarnath. I simply wanted to bring to everybody's notice that bad prognostic factors are yet to be defined, but there are definite evidences that the comorbid factors are so very important. And Dr. Malhotra has rightly emphasized that patients with cancer, they are more prone. Uh, thrombocytopenia has also been brought into the list of one of the bad prognostic factors. So with passage of time, we will be able to define them in a better way. Another point that I want to highlight that let us not forget the disease as a surgeon. The first stage, the patient has robust host defense. So the cytokines are, are on the hyper side, but not to that extent. It is followed in the next week by a second cytokine storm. So we definitely should see to it that when we are operating, the second cytokine storm has passed away. As far as the investigations are concerned, I would like to bring back to your focus that all the other investigations that we have talked now, I know facilities do not exist at very many places, but if we can assess the interleukins and interferon level, we should be able to prognosticate and most importantly, we are blaming that this particular kind of treatment has not been successful. But what becomes very important is the timing of uh, giving that particular medication and the stage of the disease. That becomes very important. For example, if IL-6 is on the higher side, tocilizumab has to be given. But this cannot be given too early and is useless if it is given too late. So this is what I wanted to bring to everybody's notice. Thank you. It was a very good discussion. Thank in you. fact, yeah, I mean, you brought the, uh, the, the right time uh, for the storm that we're all facing uh, in the patients and post-surgical or probably post-discharge kind of thing. People are just collapsing and having heart attacks and you know, which has been uh, sort of told about. Uh, any comment from the UK? On this, I mean, I know that are not easy uh, to give toxilumab uh, unless the NHS Trust has that. So, uh, what is the plan, or how do you guys, uh, uh, I mean, uh, plan, I mean, using it in UK, Anthony and Andrew? You being a geriatrician, you're able to prescribe that, but other centers? Oh, unmute. Oh, the, uh, can somebody unmute Anthony? Oh, hang, hang on. Yeah, you, you're okay. You're okay. You're on now. So, sorry, I haven't anything useful to say. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm too busy looking after hip fracture patients to... Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I, I, and is Andrew still around? Andrew? Yes, yeah, all of that. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm afraid my position is very similar to Anthony's. I um, I don't have anything to contribute with respect to that. Um, with with, with uh, regarding to that, great, great. And in Africa, you guys are using the tocilumab or any other medications? In India, we are. We have been given a few centers, but anything there? Nigeria? Uh, no, I don't have any experience with that. I'm sorry. Don't have any. Okay, okay. 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 Can I just take that from you? Yeah. So, my wife is... Um, an anesthetist and she's involved in some of the stuff. So we have no zero data and somebody had asked a question in the chat group about hydroxychloroquine. So there's a, a forearm trial going on. It's called the recovery trial in the UK where people are being, um, so one group gets hydroxychloroquine, one gets this toki, whatever it is that you were saying, so one gets the uh, remdesivir group, uh, and then there's a fourth one, which I think is uh, dexamethasone. So we, 
we will be guided. The, the difference between us and most other countries is we do have some kind of centralized research and um, centralized um, control in that we are told that this is the best evidence available today and go along that path. So I think our high numbers in the United Kingdom are not a reflection of the NHS. The NHS has dealt with a bad process decision-making at a higher level. But the, um, the guidance that we get tends to be largely evidence-based by people like the NHFD, the NJR, and all the other large audits that we carry out. And where that evidence is available, we follow it. So we are waiting for the guidance from this recovery trial to inform our treatment. Uh, I'm going to question to all the panelists. Uh, this was a question from all the hospital owners of mid-segment hospitals in India. And they said that, uh, see, for the last two decades, we've been telling operate, operate, operate. And now we are saying conservative, conservative, conservative. How do we get back to again operate, operate on this patient? How to find the patient for operation in the future? Okay, anybody for that? Uh, all of you are open for I'll, that. I'll take that. And I think it, it is all very contextual. <laughs> At the end of whether you are operate, 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 or conserve, 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 is what is best for that at that point in time we do that all the time when we see a certain patient conditions when we change our plan so there is no dogma about how to treat a disease it depends on so many patient factors your competence your available uh, um, support system and your uh, you know uh, equipments and all and here we are talking about a possible um, possible adverse outcome we are looking at the um, the uh, restricted manpower being available, the limitations of manpower, the limitations of the uh, the uh, PPEs. So I think it's all context contextual. So at this point of time, this is best for you. That's what I'll tell the patient. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's a question for Rajesh. I think John has asked here, I think in the chat box. Uh, John uh, has asked Rajesh, is RT-PCR in the CT foolproof combination against our color? Oh, it's a pretty good combination. I was actually typing it when, like your screen, my entire chat disappeared. So ah. it's a very sensitive thing. So there is no issue about RT-PCR and chest uh, CT combination being the best one. Nearly foolproof, if you may so -so, say so. But then you have to have three different types of facilities. One is for positive, one is for suspect, one is for proven. Because whenever you are taking up a patient and you find it is, uh, it is suspect and you do a CT and he comes out to be positive, then you have to decontaminate the CT machine. And as of now, as per the protocol available with us, it takes about three hours. And what is happening in a high volume center like ours, where there's a, a big demand for for CT scan every day with a large patient load. We have seven CT machines and still we are running them all the time because the patient load is so much. Load is so much. So what our radiologists are doing is <clears throat> that do a non-suspect cases in lots, six, seven, eight, and you have a suspect case who needs an emergency CT will be done after doing one lot so that other lot doesn't have to wait for so long. It's a kind of scheduling which tries to get the maximum out of machine and make sure that they say has to be strong two hours if because you found characteristic findings and now you don't want to take another patient inside because he'll get infected. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think with, with this, I think uh, we, we, we can probably wrap it up. There are a lot of unanswered questions. The questions are going to still come in and it's going to be on as long as we go on and on, we can go on. Apart from this, there are issues which I don't think we can discuss at this. This time is too short for us. The medical legal issues coming into picture is going to be another big ball game. And uh, we need to definitely look at with practicing the legal medicine as well in this COVID pandemic, as well as the future. And we hope we get the vaccine or the kind of treatment that we are talking about. And with this, I would like to ask John, you want to come in something? You're there? 
Uh, you are talking about me? John, John, Dr. John? John. Yeah. John Nebraiser, is he, has, has he left or where is he now? Uh, okay, I can't track him now. It, he's... He early was he early was thanking everybody. I think he must have. Left. He must have. He must have. He must have. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, great. I think I think with this, with this, he did, I his, think... he did his duty. He did his duty before disappearing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, he he has been on the front line in in Karnataka. Important question uh, yeah. before you end. So uh, we are talking about patient. We are talking about the hospital and everything. Uh, any of you uh, personally? using anything as a prophylactic protective agent, like HQ or anything or on the front line, pr pr protect yourself. That's very important. Fantastic. So, I'll tell, tell you, us. yeah, I'll tell you, uh, in the last two and a half months, two months plus that we have had the webinars and all that, and then exchanging the papers and going through all the reviews, in India, even before the announcement of the world leader about the magic pill, uh, we were going through all that and uh, what we have done, in fact, uh, Dr. Jha also will add on to that uh, comment. And what I have done is I have taken ivermectin and uh, that is an anti-helminthic. And I have also taken HCQ, which I've taken is 200 milligrams. I didn't take the ICMR 400 plus in the morning and 400 in the night. They said 400 Q12 hours and then maintenance, which I didn't do it. I've taken 200 because I've been giving it to my patients for arthritis for a long time now, and then they benefited. And then today I'm happy to take that. And I've, I've been protected in that sense. I've not taken the biologicals per se, which is available, but uh, no. The medicines well, are good enough. I would like it one time dose, and then yeah. you're taking 200 milligrams every day or once a week? No, I've taken I've taken once a week ivermectin, and I stopped it after two weeks. And mm -hmm. HCQ, I mean, it's HCQ is a brand in India. I would say high dose chloroquine in that process of term, 200 and 200. I just loaded myself with 400, and I've mm -hmm. taken it continuously for about uh, two weeks, and then. I have uh, not taken it after that. Dr. Jack can comment on that because he is the one of the senior orthopedic surgeon and he is the founder of Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology uh, Organization, wherein the orthopedicians with rheumatology interests are a group of doctors uh, present there. And I, I take his lead as well. Dr. Jha, can you comment yes. on something? Uh, thank you. Uh, hydroxychloroquine was put into disrepute and to the disbelief of all the practicing rheumatologists, it, it was there in the press that there has been incidences of sudden death, and which was not wrong. It was right also. Now, <laughs> ICMR made recommendations that first day prophylactic dose, 400 milligram morning and evening, and then once weekly. What I want, want to convey that a person who has never been exposed to hydroxychloroquine, don't load him on day one with 800 milligram. Because in rheumatology, we, ha, uh, we routinely adopt the policy of starting with 200 milligram and then if 300 milligram tablets are available and then to 400 milligram. So, this graduation of the dosing cannot be done here. It will have to be quick, but not to the extent of 400 milligram morning and evening. So what I advocate is a test dose of 200 milligram on day one, then repeat next day 400 milligram, and then once weekly. ICMR says seven weeks, but with the continuity continued progression of the disease, I would say, till you feel safe. So it can go beyond seven weeks. Uh, well, all the trials that have come by now, there are comparable positive and negative results. But what I very strongly feel that it is a drug, but it cannot work in the stage where the second cytokine storm has taken place. So timing becomes more important, early part of the disease, and simultaneously, 
there are trials suggesting concurrent use of azithromycin that should also be done so can we can we put this in 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 a format and send us in the whatsapp the ramanath uh, so that we come to a conclusion so 200 mg bid once first loading okay. dose no uh, i said first What? day 200 mg test dose test dose okay and second day 400 mg limit yourself only up to that if your body weight is up to 60 65 kg if okay. you are beyond that then you can take uh, 400 today and then again repeat it 400 next day and this should be preferably taking taken during the night along with your food so that gastritis problems are not there and in the night because photosensitivity reaction can take place because of exposure to sunlight but if you are indoors you are not exposed to sunlight you can take it even during daytime i did similar to what dr jha suggested i am still on uh, hcqs prophylaxis i think the evidence is uh, you know split uh, uh, i think uk is not recommending uh, i understand to say but there was a paper from hong kong yesterday which showed decreased viral load in hcqs and because hcqs is a cheap drug there is a lobby working against it because they don't exactly. get a lot of it so i think we have to put all these things together before we make our decision decision Deepak, Dr. Shikhar, Dr. the point is, it is only for seven weeks. The prophylaxis is only for seven weeks. The time which is already gone now. No, this is what I have said. Let us not limit it up to seven weeks alone, because the cases are increasing in number. Continue till uh, the numbers start decreasing. And the other issue is uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, we never did ECG on patients before starting HCQs. So why do exactly. they? Uh, so, so somebody asked that question: Why is it been put to the disrepute? And I know why. Anything Trump says, it has to be done opposite one. And this is a, a political thing. And there's a big pharma lob. HCQ is a very cheap medicine. They don't yeah. get anything out of that. The pharma lob, inclu including our uh, great, has collaborated and coming out with vaccines and medicines. If the HCQ becomes a magic pill, they their demand will not be there. They want this economy to be shut down till their vaccine and this medicine comes out. Can you believe that in the this the, in the day and age of uh, crisis, they are pol playing politics? I don't care about Trump. I don't care about anything. We have no other drug. Why why is this drug being mollified? Is this reason? This is exactly the reason. Unfortunately, I just would like to add. that whenever we are prescribing a drug we ask certain questions let us ask few questions are you on treatment for hypertension and at least ask them if the patient has it they know it are you a patient of cardiac arrhythmia because these arrhythmia patients are can get sudden death and not to be used with azithromycin is that right No, only when the patient gets infected, then use it with azithromycin. The the there is no contraindication of using azithromycin, and it is meant only to tackle the uh, respiratory infections and other complications, etc. Because azithromycin has a property of being an anti-inflammatory as well. That's correct. Dr. John, you are there. No, I am unmuted. You, you, we I... can hear you. We can hear you, man. Ah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've been waiting for you for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. So I think you know there was an elaborate discussion, and each one contributed in their own way. Uh, there were a lot of questions raised, a lot of questions answered. There were a lot of confusion still remain. but by and large we have uh, you know you know become richer by knowledge uh, there is a uk concept which is not gelling with the us concept and we in india are having a different take altogether so but by and large i think uh, we are now coming to terms with this disease and uh, hopefully you know as vivek says how long how long we just keep on waiting i think sooner or later we are going to start our elective procedures and we'll have learned from the experiences across the world now 
how to tackle this pandemic and how to be still relevant in practice and the future roadmap. I think a lot of uh, positivities uh, you know, are taken from this uh, in a panel discussion. Dr. Malhotra, Dr. Anandanu, they all contributed to a great extent. Even Egypt uh, friend, Dr. Mazia, Nigerian friend, Dr. Azipola, and uh, our uh, geriatrician friends, and Andrew Hall. Now I would like to request them to help us in uh, forming our Indian uh, hip registry, which uh, you know is a huge country. And if we can succeed in putting in an Indian hip registry, I think we can come up with a lot more information for the world. I, I, I request all the seniors here, Dr. Nanu, Dr. Deepak, all to you know put your heads down and Vivek also uh, to help us in uh, formulating our hip registry, which I've started the work on. I am just groping in the dark. I don't know how to start. But nevertheless, I've taken the first step forward and uh, look forward uh, to you know, get this going. And if that happens, I think great. So I should uh, thank all the panelists. I should thank Hadila, Opie, and uh, Kaushik for giving us this platform. It was a great experience. Special thanks to Anand Nanu for making himself free, coming over and uh, you know, giving his inputs. And um, you know, um, the issues raised by him was also very relevant. And uh, hopefully, you know, we all will see a bright day coming. And uh, even Deepak and Bharat, they always contribute a lot. And Dr. Jha is so wise that, you know, he gives us, uh, is like the ultimate word in whatever he says, as far as the medications are concerned. So all in all, it was a great experience. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think with this, we can wind off Amarnath. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. So have a nice weekend, folks. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Rajesh. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Have a nice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.